That's okay. Um, All right. So why don't, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly small city. One, two, three, four, five. So we got about 15 of us. We can get started. And, you know, um, so hi, guys. My, my name's Tom, Tom Painting. And, uh, you, you know, I'm, uh, I'm at my, my school and, uh, you know, in comfortable space. And I thought maybe we'd spend a little bit of time today uh, just kind of talking about haiku and, uh, you, you know, kind of putting our thoughts together as to what we understand it to be and maybe mm -hmm. what, what direction in which we want to take this wonderful poetic form. So how about a show of hands? How many of you um, are, consider yourself uh, fairly familiar with English language haiku? Fairly familiar. Okay, good, good. All right, so um, can I put somebody on the spot? All right. And let's see, I'm going to, I'll even put the kids on the spot. So uh, there are a few of my students here today, maybe a parent or two. So for those of you who are familiar with haiku, does anybody care to give me a definition, just a brief definition of English language haiku? And I make the distinction there between haiku in English and haiku when it's being written or spoken in Japanese. Anybody want to go out on a limb with this one? Oh, off the top. Don't, um, all, don't all speak at once. All right. <laughs> Henry, I think you, you're going to give it a shot? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I usually look up Nick's version, but just off the top, uh, a recording of an experience uh, of nature, a direct experience of nature, um, coupled with, um, with a personal um, response to it. And... Um, it, and it helps to have a season word is that contains more than a thousand words of information. And you mm -hmm. want to have a cutting point or a correggi, which separates the um, simple description from your take on it. Yeah, well, that, that's a pretty complex, yeah, pretty complex definition. It's actually very good. Okay, we're going to go, we're going to start uh, there and we're actually going to simplify it for starters. Um, so a number of years ago, I think uh, maybe Henry mentioned, you know, I was fortunate to be uh, at the Virgili uh, Association uh, in Camden. And uh, I, I can't remember exactly where the site was, but uh, I did a workshop and uh, there were actually 20 people there and they were, they were all educators. I think, I think, you know, there were a few high school teachers and, and mostly college professors, if I recall. Robin, do you remember that? Yes, we were at Rutgers University and Rutgers we had a terrific University. time out that day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kids, yeah, I've told the students this story. So I started the workshop the same way, asking these the professors, you know, and they all, they all had a, uh, they were familiar with haiku in one, one way or another. Some of them taught it in their classroom and the, uh, the high school teachers did uh, to define haiku. And the, uh, overwhelmingly, the definition was a, a three-line poem written in 17 syllables, five, seven, five. Uh, and it was about nature and human nature, you know? Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of the, the prevailing belief, I believe, you know, in, in much of uh, the poetic community. And I guess one of the things we wanna do today is kind of see why maybe that definition is, is right in some ways and maybe doesn't hold up as well in others, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna do a screen share. Do I, uh, do I have the, uh, do I have the host uh, um, ability here, um, John? Let's see, you should, let me double check. Let me just see, it looks like that. Uh, we're gonna find out, can you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. Fantastic, yeah. all right. So uh, screen sharing is good. All right, let me try it now. All right, it went away for just a minute. So the other thing, uh, the other thing that's really terrific about having some of the young people, some of the kids with me is uh, uh, girls, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, I'm an immigrant to the technological age, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, definitely a late arrival. And, uh, you know, um, so with the kids on board, uh, my security, you know, is heightened because I know that if I get into a glitch, they can bail me out, right kids? Yes. All right, good. All right, and we've seen it overwhelmingly. So the first thing I want us to do, and if you have a pen or paper with you, this would be a good time, you know, to get it out or, you know, a tablet or something to write on. Uh, we're going to start by kind of going back to the definition of haiku. And we're going to talk about haiku in, in two ways. We're going to talk about it both in terms of form and function because I think all poetry kind of deals with those two things in one way or another. For example, if I said to you form of a Shakespearean sonnet, you know, you would probably say 
what uh, 14 lines and uh, you, you know and so on ending with a you know rhyming couplet and here we go so uh, haiku has a form and it has a very strict form in japanese but the form is a little bit you know a little bit more slippery in english so here's what i would like you to do i'm going to scroll through these very very slowly and what i want you to do is take a look at the following haiku written in english and the first thing i want you to do is focus on the form of a poem but before you do that Simply as I go through these, pick the poem that speaks to you, that you know, that, that resonates or that you like the best from among these, okay? So here's the first one. I'm gonna read it to you. Dragonfly the zigzag of my attention. Okay, second one, left and right, he follows the way of his kick stone. Number three, beside the road, feathers, enough for a bird. Number four, dead hamster, my son, invents a religion. Number five, creak of the swing, my feet still reach the sky. Early spring, I sharpen the tip of each colored pencil. All that matters, waving goodbye to the school bus. A new year, the footprints between graves. Here and there, over the battlefield, fireflies and autumn chill, a butterfly swept with leaves. So take a minute and let me see if I can get all of these on the screen at once. Maybe those are too small. There we go. Yeah, it's probably too small that way. See if you can pick one that, that kind of speaks to you or that, that you're, you find yourself uh, attracted to. Okay. So I'm gonna flop back and forth here. Does everybody have one? Has everybody found one of these that they that they particularly like or that they think uh, for some reason stands out? So I'm going to stop share for a minute and go back to the group. So here's what I'd like us to do. Um, by way of uh, introduction, uh, we're going to go around and uh, I will either call your name or identify you somehow. And what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself to the group. Um, maybe say just uh, something brief about maybe why you're at this workshop or something about haiku and then read the poem uh, from among those, the one that you picked. So let's start with, uh, uh, let's see, Henry, why don't you, since you got us off to a good start. Well, you know, I think uh, number one obviously spoke to me. It was the first one I heard, but I, I went back to it two, three times and then I'm still going to pick that one, but I must say, these are all really excellent examples of English language haiku. Yeah. And okay. um, so, Henrik, will you read us the first one? Um, yeah, I didn't write it down, so I'd have to say it. But um, I'm going to read it for you. The first one was "Dragonfly, the zigzag of my attention." Yes, yes. Okay. Um, the thing I liked about it. Well, I'm going to hold was, you there. Oh, I'm going to hold you there for a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about what we like about them, but right now I just want us to hear the poems and and, and just say uh, by way of introduction, maybe a word or two about yourself, who you are, and what brings you here. Oh, um, well, uh, um, I was um, a friend of Nick Virgilio uh, briefly before he died, and um, I liked him. We had a lot of common interests, in, and um, particularly in health management, which didn't serve him well, by the way, and. Um, and Buddhism and uh, and poetry, um, so I got involved with the Nick Virgilio Haiku Association, and um, actually, um, I think my first haiku contest was at the Sacred Heart Church, and um, uh, <laughs> the pastor came in first, but they he disqualified himself. So Robin was number one, and the dinner was. Uh, uh, dinner uh, at the Elgin Diner, and uh, I was uh, I accompanied uh, Robin to that, and uh, that was a good prize, maybe the best one so far. There you go, uh, Marilyn. Uh, yeah, Marilyn, let's move on. Marilyn, tell us something about the poem you picked, and and uh, a little bit about you. Sure. Well, I hope I I uh, wrote it down correctly. Um, Creek of the swing. My feet still reach the sky. Okay. Oh, us, yeah. Tell us something about you, Marilyn. Okay. I am uh, mostly live in Michigan, but right now I am in Florida. 
Um, I came to haiku in a very meandering path. Um, I studied Sufism and then I went to Rumi's poetry and then I decided I couldn't write like Rumi and somebody suggested haiku and I fell in love with haiku and I'm here to learn as much as I can about it and to meet uh, my fellow poets. Thank you. How about uh, Barry? Hi, uh, thank you. So as I told you in the beginning, I'm calling in from Boston, although I'm originally from the great state of New Jersey. Anyway, the one that I chose, yes. I didn't write it all down, but feathers enough for a bird. I forget yeah. the first line, something by the roadside. Yeah, let's go back. Okay, yeah, so, so that one is uh, beside the road, feathers enough for a bird. Beside the road, feathers enough for a bird. Thank so you. So the the yeah. under the understatement of it just really stunned me. How much you know? How little can you say with such a huge impact? So the the emotion of it really uh, grabbed me, and I'm still feeling it. Thank you. How about Anna? Hi. Right, good good afternoon, Anna. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, it's good afternoon for you. For me here in Paris, France, it's a uh, quarter after seven in the evening. Oh my, yeah. Bonsoir. Yeah. Um, bonsoir, oui, bonsoir. Um, I um, became a haiku poet, a published haiku poet about five years ago. And um, after I had a few published haiku under my belt, I approached my children's old school here, the American School of Paris. And um, I had been poaching, uh, poaching, coaching. I had been coaching uh, middle school students, middle school students, in their poetry every spring for 15 years since my boys were at the school. And I told the teachers, you know, I'd like to give a little haiku workshop. I think now I can do it now that I'm reliably published in about eight journals that are out there. And so I've been doing that for about five years. And I thought, well, I put myself out there as, as a teacher of haiku, but I should listen to other people who teach haiku. So Tom, when I saw your um, Zoominar um, come up from the Nick Virgilio uh, house, I thought, oh, I'd better sit in and pay attention. <laughs> and, and, Anna, this is a perfect segue to what I was gonna say in the beginning and I forgot is, you know, uh, right from the start, I wanna thank all of the haiku poets that have contributed their work to the workshop that we're gonna look at today. And in particular, um, uh, haiku poet and friend of mine, Jean Emmerich, who I think just turned 90 uh, um, just a, maybe a week or so ago. And uh, Jean put together a haiku workshop back in 1996 called the Haiku, uh, the, um, the haiku Habit Workshop. And so you're gonna see some information that comes from her workshop that actually was informative to me in, in my somewhat early years of haiku. And I'm still to this day grateful to Jean for, for providing that information. Uh, Elizabeth. Hi, my name's Elizabeth. Um, I chose to come to this class because I was previously in Tom's class and the high school doesn't provide haiku classes and I just kind of missed writing them and learning about them. And the poem I chose or the haiku I chose is Dragon as well as Henry is Dragonfly, the zigzag of my attention. That one, I like that one a lot. Thank you. Thanks Elizabeth. How about you, Lily? Hi, I'm Lily. Um, I chose to come to this class because I was in Tom's class as well last year. And I really enjoy writing haiku and just thinking of memories that can become in my haiku. And the one I chose was the colored pencil one. And that really spoke to me because spring it's like new colors of spring and it just reminds me of happiness, so. Yeah, so I, I know we would get to this eventually, but um, I, I think uh, Lily, um, uh, one year, how many, maybe two years ago, Lily? Lily, Lily is a, a two-time Virgilio Award winner in, uh, in you know, and Elizabeth, wow. is a, yeah, Elizabeth is a published poet and author as well. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're up against it here. These, these kids can, you know. <laughs> You're certainly right. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, Robin. Um, I am. 
I came to haiku poetry through Henry, who had been a friend of Nick Virgilio's, and I was thunderstruck the first time I heard some poems that said so much in so little space, and I immediately felt I had to try my hand at it. I'd played in other poetic forms, but uh, haiku grabbed me and never let go. So my favorite poem here was Autumn Chill, A Butterfly Swept Up With The Leaves. Yeah. It's got all of that crackly end of oh, yeah. the live seasons embedded in it, and it really strikes me. But uh, I don't miss a chance to do a workshop because each one gives me a new bit of inspiration or angle or touchstone to use in my writing. I love it. Thank you, Robin. Well, let's see, is it uh, Angie? Or is it hi. Angie? Angie. Angie, hi Angie. Um, I'm Angie, I'm in Cheshire, UK. Um, we're quarter past six here, not quite as uh, as late as Paris. We've got another hour to catch you up. <laughs> um, the, um, I haven't done a massive amount of, of haiku. I, it, it's a form that I admire rather than feel competent in, if that makes any sense. Um, and I went to a very good workshop that was um, one of the joys of Zoom came from Japan in the autumn. And it was based around this book, which is the pillow book of Sai Shonagon. And so it used little extracts from the pillow book to inspire haiku. And so I've been writing a few since then, but I am by no means, you know, competent in it. And well, I, I pick them on here and there over the battlefield, fireflies, because I like the the turn towards the end of it and the fact that it wasn't explicit about the season, but it was implied by the observation of nature. Thank you, Angie. Good. Is it Asha? Asha, I think you're muted. See, can we hear you now? Yeah. Asha, I think you're I think you're still muted. Are you working on that? Thumbs up if you're if you're working on that. Asha just uh, typed into the chat. I don't know if the microphone is working for them or not. Oh, okay. They oh, said the dragonfly. Yeah, there you go. Asha in the chat. Uh, she likes the one with the dragonfly. I guess that's three of you, uh, the three dragonfly ones. And drag <laughs> dragonfly, the zigzag of my attention. Yeah, Asha, I'll be sure I check the chat here for, for those of you who are going to just uh, uh, kind of check in. in that. How about you, Jennifer? Oh, Asha, do you want, can you type something about where you are or um, what brings you here today? So they are in Bristol, England. Okay. Wow, we got, a, got an international crowd here. Yeah. All right, good. Dragonfly interest also because I'm interested in neurodivergent conditions, ADHD, autistic spectrum, attention is an issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're, yep, absolutely. Je How about you, Jennifer? I, um, I'm in California. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, I like the haiku about the swing. I can't see the, the actual well, haiku. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that one to okay, you thank here. You. Um, yeah, cr creep, creak of the swing, my feet still reach the sky. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I became interested in haiku. Um, I've been in isolation for about a year. My husband's an ER doctor in California. And so um, I've written uh, about 45 pieces about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. My experience um, in isolation and nature. So I, I have actually written haiku for humor magazines, and then I started. I'm I just started really writing this year. Although I've taken a lot of workshops in the past, but I actually went on a haiku website and realized I knew nothing about haiku. So, 
<laughs> so I'm here to, to learn and I appreciate this. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, Suresh. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. Oh, sir. <laughs> Good evening, sir. So I'm Suresh and I'm from India. I'm working as a teacher in a residential school in India. And uh, uh, sir, I've been, I've been writing haiku for the last one year. Uh, before that, I used to write uh, free, free verse poems. And uh, uh, actually, I watched a uh, YouTube video of uh, Kala Ramesh ma'am. Uh, she, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, teaching haiku to students of uh, uh, a university. I just happened to watch this uh, video on YouTube and you know, I felt so happy after watching that video and I tried uh, writing. But, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, I, I feel that I need to learn and unlearn and relearn. I think that's, that's what has brought me to this, to your, you know, uh, to this uh, uh, class. I feel that I need to learn, uh, relearn, you know, and know a lot and lot about, you know, writing. And so one, one uh, thing, I don't know, very peculiar because most of them like the same haiku that is creak of the spring my feet still reach the sky I mean I love this haiku why I like this uh, I thought I know I, I have seen a film uh, called Pathir Panchali uh, by a great director uh, Sachidit Ray uh, an Indian uh, he, he had he had you no know, he had this uh, uh, directed this movie Pathir Panchali in which there is a swing a scene of a swing where you know the the children you know, the swing and the swing goes up to the sky and you know uh, that brings the children very close to nature i don't know at that scene you know i still remember that scene i think i could connect this haiku with the with the movie that i had seen it's so beautiful i mean and uh, like it's like you are opening up all your senses uh, like you know uh, haiku is all about that uh, where you open all your senses to nature uh, you know, that's what I loved about this haiku. Th thanks a lot, sir. I'm <laughs> well, thank <laughs> you. And, and, uh, uh, Suresh, I, you know, I'm going to agree with you 100%. Uh, it, every one of us is, if, we're, if you take to the haiku path, we're all somewhere on the road. And I don't <laughs> think any of us will ever g totally get there. But I, yes. I'm in the same, I'm in the same boat as you. You know, I, I, I see myself as simply someone who, who is, a, is a practitioner, but is still learning as I go. Yes. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit later about how haiku has informed my life and, and, and how I believe it can inform our lives in a way that extends beyond the poetry. So um, how about you, Sean? Do you, you have any words about haiku? How about a favorite poem from here, even though you're the, uh, you're the master of ceremonies here tonight? No, that's fantastic. I'm so happy you included me. Um, I have to agree with uh, Suresh the, uh, the, as far as uh, not the same poem but as far as my inspiration as to why I, I like the poem the most of the uh, the one with the fireflies over the battlefield reminds me of a film um, I believe it's a Japanese I think it's a Miyazaki film about World War II about these Japanese uh, um, you know about the, uh, the soldiers and, and their graves and the fireflies uh, over it and it's you know even though haiku is supposed to be um, it's not always metaphorical it, it, when it is metaphorical, like with the fireflies as, you know, spirits or, or whatever, I think that's really cool. Um, anyway, I'm Sean. Uh, my name is Sean Lynch. I am the new uh, program director at the Nick Virgilio Haiku Association. Um, and I was first introduced to haiku um, seriously, uh, probably like 10 years ago, uh, because of Rocky Wilson, I was a student at Rutgers Camden. Um, so I, I befriended Rocky Wilson, a uh, fantastic local poet, um, and Lamont Steptoe, um, another fantastic, uh, poet, uh, from around here. So that's how I got really involved. And then, um, uh, I have a book of 100 haiku chapbook, um, and I read for the NVHA in the fall, and now I'm happy to be working with them. So thanks for being here, and thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, so Sean, uh, keep, hold that thought about metaphor, because uh, later on, depending on how far we go, and if, if we exhaust ourselves today, you know, if they'll have me back, I'll do, I'll, we'll do round two, okay? Because I can make a long discussion out of a short poetic form. Isn't that true, uh, Lily <laughs> <Yeah>. and Elizabeth? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I know you had to be scratching your head, right? <laughs> but um, but we'll talk about that. That comes, you know, probably I have, I have sort of a slide presentation. I think that's slide 93 or four uh, about the difference between a direct and indirect metaphor and how haiku works that way. I wanted to go back and uh, just before I lose my thought here, uh, Shiresh, um, you, you know, uh, you're over in India, and I, I was actually able to go to India a few years ago, uh, and I was I was uh, in the company of uh, a very wonderful haiku poet. Uh, she's since passed away. Do you know the name Anjali Diodar? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Anjali was a personal friend of mine, and, and a number of years ago, I, I've got to stay with Anjali uh, and visit her in, 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 uh, in India, and we actually did went to some schools and did, did uh, you know did some haiku. Uh, you have another wonderful poet, uh, Kala Ramesh. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm yes. glad you know those names because both of those uh, people, and for, for the rest of you, uh, Anjali Diodar, D E O D A R, um, yes, who I think passed away three or four years ago now, uh, was an absolutely wonderful person. She would make um, uh, somewhat annual trips or semi annual trips to the States and, and participate in. Uh, and, and conferences here and workshops. And then uh, Kala Ramesh is also, uh, she's a very active poet. She does a yes. lot of education in India. So uh, yes. at, the end, at the end of the, the, the workshop today, you know, I'll share some names and resources with you and maybe you know, some, um, some things you can check out. So, so uh, I'm gonna kind of go on some tangents here. Um, that's another thing the girls know all too well, you know, and, and the only problem with a tangent is if you, you get lost, you know, you hope somebody brings you back so if I get too far out on the proverbial limb, you, you all got to say to me, Tom, you know, you're losing track of where you once were. And <laughs> back, okay. But I want to look at that one poem. I mean, uh, there are so many of those poems. My favorite, by the way, is Dead Hamster, My, my Son Invents a Religion. And some of you pointed to that, you know, to the, 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 the idea of making a connection with either a movie or a, or a book or an experience, you know, and for me that that poem resonates because there's a very personal experience, you know, um, it reminds me of an, uh, you know, an event that occurred when my when my son was was a little little boy. Um, but uh, yeah, haiku is about connections. I think one of you mentioned that and the connections, you know, kind of go in two directions. You know, we want to look at haiku as a road uh, uh, to, to inside of ourselves. And Lily often mentions it when she talks about, you know, the rich, uh, you know, fertile ground of memory. And then, and then we want to see haiku as a, a way to connect with the world around us, you know. So we're actually looking in two directions simultaneously. Um, another thought I had is that very, um, how many of you did pick the poem about the swing? You know, my feet still reach the sky. I'm going to bring that up. I want to bring that up one more time and look at that. See if I can even find it. Okay. Let me just bring this up so I, I can say it correctly. Okay, here it is. Um, oh yeah, Creek of the Swing, my feet still reach the sky. Okay, so haiku, you know, there are a lot of different ways in which a haiku moment manifests itself, but one is, is almost, it almost feels like a narrative, and this poem to me sort of strikes a narrative uh, pose. So creak of the swing, my feet still reach the sky. So I'm just going to throw this out there. In your mind's eye, who, who do you think the speaker of this poem is and why? Yeah, yeah, Anna. Well, the, the word uh, still gives it away. Um, it's an older person, probably me, once in a while. I'll get on the swing <laughs> mm -hmm. at the playground, and I'll see if I can still get going, and if I can, and I can still see the sky. So um, it was that word still that gave it away for me, that it was an older person reminiscing about a childhood thrill. Thank I you like so the much. echoes of creek because the creek could be the swing or the creakiness we feel as we get older. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we'll, we're going to talk more about that. But uh, but Anna, you're uh, you hit the bullseye with that one. That's that, that's what I kind of had in mind. And so one of the things to consider, we will we'll talk about the economy of language and, and the precise use of language. If you take that word "still" out of that poem, it changes the meaning tremendously, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, great, great. So just kind of store that thought away because eventually we're going to talk about you, you know how we pair these these 
short poems down to their bare essentials and, and, and include only the words that are absolutely necessary. Okay, so I'm gonna go to screen well, share. Can I uh, just interject one thing yeah. about that poem that I, strikes me? You know, I really like poems that have something to do with, you know, sight and sound and stuff like that, uh, the five senses, but this poem actually deals with a feeling of gravity, which I don't think I've, I can recall hearing or feeling in a poem before. And I'm one of those people who swings still. Yeah. Creek, Creek is spelled every... like brook, yeah. like a brook. It's two E's, is it not? Yeah. So it's not Ooh. Creek. Was it spelled? So Was it I found that wrong? interesting as well. Yeah. Maybe it was spelled wrong. Well, maybe or maybe not. I well, mean, maybe it was spelled wrong. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah, and, and you know, you know who'd be responsible for that? <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, well, I, I, t I tell the kids one of the greatest fears a classroom teacher has is when you know, back in the old days with the blackboard, and now with the dry erase board, or even when you're typing, is that you're going to get up in front of your class and spell a word wrong, have oh. it read because you should know better, you know. So the quickest solution is to do just what I did now, own it and move on, right? <laughs> I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go fix that. So um, Henry, let me see, there was something else you just said that, oh, um, I, I've lost my thought, but you're down to slide 32. Oh, oh I know <laughs> the, the sense of movement. Now that we're gonna look at that because you know the other thing we're gonna talk about very, very shortly are the five senses, you know, how, how high could an imagistic form, but there are there are senses that kind of extend beyond the five that we commonly think of, you know, and, and those are one of them is the sense of movement, the sense of heat and cold, or the sense of pain. And I, and when I say that it's not emotional pain, we all need to get over that to some degree, but but the physical pain. That, that occurs that's sensory, but you can't quite pinpoint it, you know? So the, the, the illustration to the kids, and they're all going to nod their heads right now, I'd say, well, you know, the sense of pain is, it, it can be imagistic. Uh, for example, you know, not, not emotional pain, because that's too abstract, but physical pain. And, and then I would say to them, like, uh, the, the pain of having a headache. Girls, do you remember this? And how many of you have a headache now because I won't stop talking? <laughs> and, and all the hands would go up. Right, right, Lily? Well, you know, because I'm hard of hearing, uh, you're talking, I can, you're very clearly spoken though, so that's okay. Well, I'm probably screaming at you right now from this classroom because you feel <laughs> so far true. away, but all right. But I have gonna, volume control here. <laughs> have, oh, thank God, right? Yeah, yeah. My wife has that too, it's called on and off. <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm going to go back to screen share because we actually started this conversation, uh, you know, getting to know one another, but also, uh, you know, this idea of form and function. So I, I want to take a look at haiku form and because one of the first things that that I would advocate is how do we break out of that the restriction of the 575 syllable count. And there, you know, we could, we'll talk about that maybe today about why Japanese is structured that way and English is not. But to get a sense of maybe why that is simply by observing the form of some poems that were, are published in English. So all the poems I'm gonna show you today um, are, have been published in, in a journal somewhere along the line, you know? And uh, let, me, let me do the screen share again. So there's my desktop. Can you all see my screen okay? Blurry. Yeah, it's blurry. Blurry. We Is it okay it. now? No, no, it's green with fuzzy lines. Green with fuzzy lines. What's going on here? Holy mackerel. Let me let me quit out of this and try it again. All right. I hope we're not having technical difficulty. All right. Maybe I need more light in this room. Mm -hmm. Let me try that. I'm going to open the shades a little bit. All right. Is it better now? No. no. Oh my. Okay, give me a second. I feel like I'm at the ophthalmologist. Any better? No, we're seeing a a a, a pale yellow green window with a line across the center and a border on the right and bottom. Oh my gosh, that that is that is that's not good. Did you Have try you going to the next page? Hmm. Try going to the next page and see if we can say if problem. this works. Does this one work? Nothing changed. 
Nothing changed. Oh, well, this is very troubling. All right. Well, let's see here. Now that, that, that's clearly, well, let me try this, all right? Um, let's go here. Can you see this thing okay? Still seeing you. You're still seeing me. All right, let me, let me uh, quit out of here. I'm sure there's a problem, there's, a, okay, let's try this. Okay, uh, how about now? No, still good. Have you expanded your screen at all? Did you shrink it back down? Um, I'm going to expand it right now. Can you see this? No, I would go the other way. I shrink think you've it. zoomed way in. I think you need to zoom back out if that's possible. Yep, shrink okay. it down. Zoom. All right. Let's see that's here. what I thought too. Okay. It's like you have some illustration drawn on here, but we can only see a black blob. Oh my gosh, this is this is this is shocking. Okay, nothing now, huh? Tom, could you try emailing it to somebody else who you've got their email? Well, and this, see if they can share it. Yeah, well, this is a uh, this is a whole. Um, it's not a Google uh, Doc uh, or a mm. Google slideshow. It's an old PowerPoint program. Mm -hmm. Could I do that? I could display a PowerPoint if you send it to me. You've got my email. I, yeah, let me just try this one more time. Yep. Um, let me try screen, screen share one more time. All right. There. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's getting better here. We got yes. it. Now we're better. Yeah. Thank you. We got it. Oh, I'm going to haiku. All right. Yeah. I'm going to now. How's that? Perfect. Good. Is that? Oh, yeah. Clear? I can so, pinch out the screen and everything. Yeah, it's not on slideshow though. It's you've got all the slides down the side. Yeah. That. Uh, let's let's try this. All right. Well, will um, this work, this Tom, work like this? Tom, yes, but if you wanted to, there's a way to present it to where it's like you can see one slide at a time. Okay, Elizabeth, you want to help me with that? Um, well, I'm not really seeing it actually, but there's usually... I see it here on the bottom, uh, at the very bottom right, you'll see a something that looks like a little TV on a stand, a button at the bottom. Yes, you hit yes. that, uh, move left, 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 right there. There. How about that? Bingo. That way. Yeah. Wow, I was just about you know, <laughs> going to have a meltdown. All right. So if we go, let me see if this works. All right. So here's all the poems. I know this is pretty small, but you can you see this okay? Perfectly. Uh, I can, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. what we want to do is if you can now, if you haven't written it down, if you if you can maybe jot down the poem that you picked again, you know, mm -hmm. or commit it to memory. I'm going to ask you some questions about the poem because that'll that'll kind of point point to, you, you know, somewhat about the form and why not the 575. I mean, I think that's a good place for us to go. So has everybody got the poem that they selected? Yeah. Okay, cool. So so the first thing I want you to do is really quickly, I know this is it seems pretty basic, but how many lines do these poems have? Now just write that down. Okay. okay. So how many, how many lines? Now, everybody should get this one correct, right? All right, how many, how many lines? There are three lines, right? All right, count the words in the poem that you selected. How many, how many words are in the poem that you selected? Mm -hmm. so, so let's go through real quickly and, and just shout out. I'm gonna, I'll call your name that way we won't have like a free for all. Um, how many words? And I want you just to kind of listen to this. Okay, so uh, uh, Marilyn, how many words in the mm -hmm. poem you selected? Ten. All right, Marin's got ten. Uh, Barry, how many? Eight. All right, uh, Anna. Eight. Eight. Uh, Angie. Seven. Okay, Jennifer. Ten. Sh uh, Sh Shabash. Ten, sir. Okay, uh, Asha. Six. Oh, you're back. Good, Robin. Nine. Okay, um, our Elizabeth and um, is Elizabeth and. Uh, um, Lily still here? Yes. Okay, I, I can't see any of my screen. Go ahead, Elizabeth, how many? Mine had seven. Okay, how about you, uh, Lily? Mine had eight. You had eight, okay. Um, Sean, are you still there? Yeah, eight. Okay, 
right. So, so there, there are some numbers. Now, so we could do some quick arithmetic. Somebody just volunteer. About what do you think the average number of words would be then for those poems? Somebody could just shout it out. What do you think the average is? Seven to eight. Eight. Nine. Eight. Nine. Right, right. I'm going to give you, yeah, I'm going to give you some, some sort of rules, okay, for English language haiku. And, and uh, these rules are not carved in stone, but they're based on, on both observation and actually a little research I did a number of years ago when, when I first got involved in haiku. So when you're writing your own haiku, it's fair to say that you should strive for 10 or fewer words. You should strive for 10 or fewer words. That doesn't mean you're not gonna, you're gonna find poems that don't have more than 10 words, but there, there, there's something about the, 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 the brevity of, of the poem that, that occurs within 10 or fewer words. Now you think I'm absolutely nuts and I won't get, this is a tangent. I, I could tell you how I came to haiku, but I had a whole year off from school and, uh, about uh, you know, 1990, you know, 1998. I had a sabbatical to study haiku. And it was only because I was staying home with my uh, infant daughter for a year. And I thought that I needed to do something. So between diaper changes and bottle feedings, the <laughs> short poetic form would be perfect. And I really went into it simply because I, need, I, want, I needed the time away. And that's where the, the sort of haiku journey began. But part of, part of what I did was I looked at literally hundreds, if not thousands of poems written in English that appeared in, in, in mainline journals, mostly print journals, all print journals back then, and did a, did a word count and discovered that very thing, that the vast majority of haiku written in English w fell between somewhere be uh, between seven and 10 words with about eight, give or take, being, being the average. So when we look at form in English language haiku, I think that that's a fair assumption we can make. That you know the 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 most of the journals uh, are going to um, ask that you you know do uh, look at that number of words. Okay, so do 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 me a, uh, another quick count in the poem you've chosen. Count the number of syllables, the total number of syllables. And if you want, what's interesting is put the syllable count down after every line. Okay. So, you know, we got everybody in class will be clapping our hands, right? Right, Lily? Yes. Clapping my hands, all right, counting syllables. Yeah, now some of the words, some English word, uh, language words are kind of tr tricky. Some people pronounce them with one or two syllables, so don't get caught up on that. It can be whatever you say it is, right? You're the poet. If, if it's one syllable to you, that's fine. If it's two, that's fine. Okay, so uh, Robin, wh how many syllables? Twelve. Twelve. Asha? Eleven. Okay, uh, Shiresh? So uh, 10, 10 to the 10. ten. Uh, let's see, Lily. 12. 12. How about Jennifer? 10. 10. Angie? 11. Anna? 11. Henry? Uh, 11. Barry? 11. Okay, who didn't I call on you? Jennifer, did I get you? Yes. Okay, so so let's make a generalization about, a, about syllable count. About how many syllables you think is the average? around 11, I thought. Yeah, yeah, bingo. And in fact, there, there might be something almost as magical in English language haiku about 11 as there is in Japanese about 17. But you can't be 100% sure there. But, but so all Japanese haiku are written in 17, we, we would say syllables, but the, the, the sound unit is called an an, and I'll talk to you a little more about that later. But, but in English, uh, you, there's no exact number. So it's fair to say that in your haiku, you should strive for about 11 to 13 syllables. 11 to 13 syllables, give or take, okay? So, so we're talking about approximations. And again, we'll get into that why that why uh, earlier. But if, if you, and that's the other thing I did during my year away, I looked at hundreds if not thousands of haikus uh, written in English and counted syllables and did an average and that and that was the average was right around 11 or 12. Okay, so now we're looking at form. So we've got 10 or fewer words, uh, 11 to 13 syllables, give or take. Here's the tricky question. Read the poem in your, in your mind's eye or whatever, read the poem to yourself and then tell me how many parts does the poem have? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that swing stone poem again. Cre uh, Creek, Creek of the Swing, 
my feet still reach the sky. Creek of the string, my, my feet still reach the sky. Um, here and there over the battlefield, fireflies. Okay, dead hamster. My son invents a religion. How, mm -hmm. how many parts did the, does the poem have? Who wants to venture a guess? Two. I think two parts. Two. two. Yeah, yeah. So now, wow, now we're, now we're getting somewhere with the form. We can say that usually haiku written in English are three lines. They generally have 10 or fewer words. They have 11 to 13 syllables, generally, and it's a two-part poem. Okay, so I think we're kind of now figuring out a little bit of what the form mm -hmm. is like in English. Any any questions about that? Any questions? Mm. Okay, so I'm going to stop share for a minute. So I think that that's pretty enlightening. And I think one of the things we can do with haiku, one of the ways to kind of get a sense of how it's written in English is simply to read a lot of them, you know, and see where, where those parameters are, where people push out against them. Okay. All right. And, uh, you know, I have some interesting anecdotes about, about a very, very famous poets who continue to write in uh, 17 syllables, 575. One of them is a poet, uh, if he walked in this room right now, I'd either faint or bow down. His name's Billy Collins, oh, mm -hmm. who I've heard speak a number of times. Mm -hmm. And um, here's, a, here's a little aside. So Billy Collins, how many of you have ever heard Billy Collins read or speak? Yeah, he's a wonderful poet. I love his work. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, the editor of the, uh, a very good haiku journal called uh, Modern Haiku, the editor was Char Charlie Trumbull. And uh, I got the issue and I looked forward to it every, you know, every quarterly when it came out. And there um, was a haiku by Billy Collins. Not only was it a haiku, but it was actually the month later selected as best of issue. And I read it with a great deal of surprise because it was, it, was, it was okay. If one of my students had written it, I would say, no, take it back to the drawing board. It's too heavy, you know, too heavy handed. There were 17 syllables, five, seven, five. And so I, 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 you know, not to feel too puffed up about myself, I called the editor, Charlie Trumbull, who I absolutely admire. He's a terrific haiku poet. And, and I said to Charlie, Charlie, what gives? You know, th there's this, you know, I know is it 575 poem in modern haiku. How could you? And his answer was haiku is a four line poem. And I said, how could that be? And he said, the fourth line is the author's name. <laughs> yes, I called Charlie a bad word, you know, you, you, you know, it, it sort of sounds like prostitute, but never mind. Um, anyway, uh, let's go back to, to the workshop. All right, I'm going to go share again. So, all right. So is there anything else you noticed about those poems? Because, you know, there's a couple of other things that are kind of lurking when it comes to form. Anything else you noticed about them? Any Most other of them there? had nature reference, didn't they? Yes. So we're going to talk about that. Henry alluded to that earlier, you know, na nature, nature being a part of haiku traditionally. How many of you know the word senru, S-E-N-R-Y-U, senru? Yeah. Um, so we'll look at that too. Back in the older days and not, not too long ago, maybe 10, 20 years ago, um, haiku poets in this country made kind of a distinction between haiku and senru. And a senru being a haiku-like poem, but not necessarily not dependent on a nature image, and that 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 def, that definition has sort of uh, uh, become obscure. There's no longer really a big argument about that, and we'll look at that. Uh, how about uh, a couple of uh, leading questions? Uh, how about capital letters in haiku? Yeah, very few capitals and very little. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very little, you know, capital letters, maybe the, uh, the, the pronoun I and, and, and proper nouns might be capitalized, but very few capital letters and virtually no punctuation. And in fact, if you go back and look at some of haiku written in English a number of years ago, they were, they were more punctuation heavy than they are now, you know, with either ellipses or dashes, but, but not so much anymore. But the, we'll, we'll look at that too, because those are, those are at your disposal and they, they serve a purpose. Okay, so let me see if I can get this thing to move. Okay, so um, here are, this kind of gets in, um, 
All right, let me move on here. Okay, so let's go, let's begin to look at our, our definition a little bit of haiku. Um, there we go. Can you all see that? I'm trying to keep you on the screen so I can see you, but it's not covering up my presentation, is it? Nope. Okay. No. So haiku, a moment keenly perceived linking nature to human nature. That is actually the old Haiku Society of America definition, which I, I, I like. Uh, the new definition to me seems a little bit wordy, a little bit convoluted. But, you know, the, 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 the linking nature and human nature, which Henry mentioned. And I really like this, uh, this quote from Matthew uh, Cirillo. Haiku is a way of making manifest that which is, I can't even, that which is uh, already understood, but not so well expressed. And I really, really like that. You know, how often in our lives do we get an inkling of something? We get that sort of a vibe. We understand something, but we either don't take the time or we, we don't pause ourselves long enough to, to kind of... Uh, uh, spend some time with that understanding and render it into words, which is the real challenge. Okay. Why this is doing this? Okay. So I'm going to go pretty quickly. Uh, what is an image? Haiku is an imagistic form of poetry. Images uh, are words or phrases the writer selects to evoke a picture in the reader's mind. And here we go. The things named in an image can be seen, touched, heard, smelled, tasted, or the reader may get an image from a sense of temperature, pain, or movement. And that, that's what I think, Henry, you mentioned it, right? The movement of the swing. Yeah, the sense of movement is, is very, you know, is, it resides, is imag imag imagistic, okay? So what I would tell students, and I, and I tell myself this uh, 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 um, periodically throughout the day is, if I want to begin to become a practitioner of haiku, I have to become really much more observant of the, the environment around me. So, you know, stop, look, and listen. I think uh, in, in, in his wonderful book, Haiku Guy, I would recommend it. The name of the book is Haiku Guy, and it's by Professor David Lanou, L-A-N-O-U-E. And if you don't get all of this down, I've, I've got sort of a, a, you know, a cheat sheet later on that I can give this to you. But Haiku Kai is just a wonderful book uh, that it's sort of a three-part personal narrative uh, novel and high school instructional guide. David Lanou in the book says uh, he got his best advice from, about Haiku from the Sisters of Mercy when he was in the third grade, which was stop, look, and listen. You know, so I will periodically uh, during the day, just just stop, pause for a minute. It's almost a kind of mindfulness, and and just kind of go through a checklist. Right now, I see, I hear, I smell, I taste, I touch. In the old days, I would have a little pocket notebook, and and jot down, you know, uh, images, things that struck me. Now I've got my phone, so it's really a quick fix. You know, I can just type something in. Okay. Uh, to to kind of uh, develop a haiku habit, you might start. Oops. Let me go back. I'm hitting too many buttons here. Um, you might start by, um, before you get out of bed in the morning, simply open your eyes and, and take, take stock of the, the world around you. First thing you see when you get up, your first observation in the morning. Here's one. I'd like you all to do this right now. This I always have fun with this one. Uh, and, I, and I love this as a prompt. Uh, how about one smell you remember, remember from childhood? Can we go around and kind of, kind of share those? Um, Ramesh, do you have a, or, uh, Suresh, do you have a, do you have a, a smell you remember from childhood? So the rose that uh, we used to grow in front of our house in a small pot, uh, it, it smelled so sweet and okay. suddenly it came to my mind. Was it a small, you said a small pot of roses? Yes, a small pot of roses. Okay, I want you to write, write down now, write down the small pot of roses. Write that down. Okay. Just, yeah, the, the, the small pot of roses, because already you've done something, you know, uh, Suresh could have left that with the, the smell of the rose, but what, what did he add to that image? He, the small pot, you know, so, so right away, there's half a haiku, isn't there? Okay. If we can figure out the, the where, the when, to, to, to who it's associated with, that might be one of those moments keenly perceived. Where was the small pot when you recall it in your mind's eye? Uh, in, in the side of my house, I mean, very close to the door of my house. It was, uh, my mom had kept it there and she loved it so much. Uh, 
and you know I, I i found it very different from all the other roses because it gave a very sweet smell I, that, that that was still i remember that for the smell of the rose because even now i have i grow roses but they don't smell so sweet as oh. that rose yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 L- L- lily can you under- can you relate to what uh, sharesh is saying yes I, you know what, and so can I, because because Lily is the person who finds who found most of her haikus in in the in sort of the rich treasury of her memory. So Shiresh, right right now, I would say just write down the small pot of roses, my mom on the side step, and and in your mind's eye, go back to that and and narrow it down to to isolate one one moment keenly perceived. I think you've got a haiku there. I do. So who else has got a smell from childhood? That, that comes back to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Robin, you? Apple, apple pie in my grandmother's kitchen. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, how about Anna? D- anything that strikes you? Yeah, actually, underneath the um, the window of my childhood bedroom, um, my mom grew um, Lily of the Valley. Uh-huh. And uh, it blooms early. It doesn't stay very long. But when it's there, you just... Um, you, you love it so much. I mean, so when I smell Lily of the Valley, I'm transported back to my childhood bedroom. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So there, there's an image, you know, the, the childhood bedroom. So I, it's fair to say that I would guess that every one of us, most every one of us could write a haiku simply starting with, with a childhood, childhood bedroom. Childhood bedroom, right? We, yeah. we, we all probably could do that, for better or worse, I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, who else has got a smell from childhood that, that really is evocative? Uh, well, who, I, do, um, hmm? I got the uh, honeysuckle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, eating and smelling it and, uh, mm. in the driveway uh, outside my house growing up in New Jersey, and then eating them, mm. the, little, uh, the little bit of honey that comes out, pulling it out. I know, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, we're, we're kind of a floral group here. A lot of flowers. Who else is, who's got one? Anybody else's smell from childhood? I got one here. Yeah, Henry. From, on the road from the heat, smell of the sea. The smell of the heat coming up. Of the heat. <clears throat> you know, I've lived on a farm about a mile from the ocean. We go down to the beach and I remember the smell of the ocean it was just so exciting from um, kind of the heat of the farm. Yeah. So I mean, it wasn't that far, yeah. but it was still so you know, uh, made a big impression on me. And I still go to the ocean as much as I can. Elizabeth, do you have one? A smell from childhood? Um, yes. I think you've probably heard this one before, but um, mentholatum, that one always just hits home. Didn't you, didn't you write a haiku about that? I actually wrote, I think, like an, a paragraph or an essay, but I would like to eventually write a hi- haiku. Yeah, how many of you know this? It's sort of that Vicks Vapor Rudd mentally. Oh, yeah. 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 <clears throat> so, so um, we could we could spend we could spend a whole workshop simply, you know, kind of uh, talking about the sense of smell and and, and you know what what uh, mm-hmm. what that evokes, you know, what memories come back. Um, I think research would would sort of suggest that the sense of smell olfactory is probably the most reliable route back to you know an authentic experience when when we were younger. So so one of your haiku practices, and in fact the kids do this, you know, uh, is is write a haiku that 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 sort of centers on the sense of smell that you remember. Okay, um, we could spend a lot of time in this, but we won't. Uh, the other thing that I'd like you to do. Um, because what I want you to do, what we all should do is begin, begin to collect images, you know, to stop, look and listen and, and, and not overlook things. They may not, uh, you know, um, evolve into high clue right away, but um, they might. So the, the one, three sounds you hear in your neighborhood, you could add uh, this time of year, you know, three, three sounds you hear in your neighborhood this time of year, and those sounds may change as the season progresses, you know, and haiku being a very seasonal, you know, it's kind of anchored in the seasons works very well. The other thing is, uh, again, always write down a few images of your own, just be on the lookout for those and, and don't worry about them being haiku, but simply be an observer. So where do images to come from? Uh, Lily said this over again, over and over again, um, memory, 
fair game for haiku. You can actually use your imagination in haiku. Okay. Uh, the story I tell the kids uh, for my, I think for my 60th birthday, I wanted to uh, skydive. <laughs> right. I don't know. Lily, do you remember this, Elizabeth? I do. Yes. I wanted to skydive and my wife told me not on your life. I don't know if that was a pun or not. Not on your life. Not until your, your, your kids are grown up and leave the house. <laughs> so, so uh, I've got another demarcation coming, you know, another, another two months. My, my youngest son, he just left for college last week, two weeks ago. And uh, I'm, I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn, you know, the next decade. And so guess what I'm going to ask for, for my birthday. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do it eventually, right? But, but the fact is how this deals with, with imagination is uh, even though I'd never skydived, um, I could probably imagine what, what that free fall, what that would feel like with the wind, you know, rushing by. And I could write a haiku about that. And, mm -hmm. uh, and as long as it rings true, as long as it feels authentic to the re reader, you know, there's a thing called believing and doubting. As long as the reader believes it, then let the poem can stand on its own, you know? So feel free to plug in your imagination, take some poetic license with haiku. And of course, mm -hmm. many of the best haiku come from the here and now, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so um, let, let's, let's stop share for a minute. I hope I can get back on. Okay, so am I, am I going too fast or? or All right. All right. Okay. So you got, you know, you all got to rein me in or, or, or you know, like, they say, slow down, pause. If you have a question, just jump right in. Okay. Yep. Okay. Orfus. Okay. So, right. so far, so good. I just have a question. Um, yeah. Is it? I mean, is it sort of a rule that the haiku has to be rooted in the natural world? Jennifer, that's a great question. We're going to talk. Can just hang on with that. We are going to talk about that probably in hour four or five. We'll get to that today because that 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 sort of uh, that's the idea of you know haiku being a poem linking nature and human nature and its companion form called senru, okay, which is a haiku like poem that that doesn't depend on a nature image, okay. And again, the distinction twenty or so twenty five years ago, uh, uh, people would fight over it. They'd argue, and they've stopped arguing. If you there's a there's a series of uh, uh, books. It's called the Red Moon Anthology by Red Moon Press. Jim Cashian is the editor. And if you go back, so I think they're they're celebrating 25 years this year. If you go back to the Red Moon Anthologies from about 1996, uh, seven, eight, nine, I think you would find two sections: one for haiku and one for senru. Although the poems structurally, the form of the poem looks looks alike. But uh, the, 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 the substance, you know, the haiku would supposedly have nature images and the senru would not be dependent on nature images. And, and, but there's such an overlap. We'll look at some today and you can decide the argument now. So now Red Moon Anthology, there's not two sections. It just says haiku slash senru. You know, people, people wasted a lot of time and there were a lot of friendships lost over the argument, right? I think David Lanoue wrote a book in his series that started with Haiku Guy and, and, and you know, maybe the fourth book in the series was called Haiku Wars. And I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that was one of the, one of the arguments, you know, that got started at this Haiku conference. Okay. Hey, we have some new, new participants. Hey, uh, was it Karen and Tom? Yeah. Hello from Wales. Oh, hello. Where are you from, Karen? Wales, UK. Oh my gosh. That's good. You know Lovely what, Karen? Well. I was supposed to go to Wales last summer and uh, then COVID. Oh, what's, you would what, have loved it. What's the big mountain there? The highest, one of the three big peaks. Snowdon. In the Snowdon. Mount I Snowdon. Have, I can I see have, it from the back of my house. On the front of my house is on the sea front. So when I when I get there eventually, you're going to kind of point me to the trail? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me. <laughs> that was, that I'll was find and watch you climb. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what's that? What's that, Karen? <laughs> And you can come swim in with me. I, I live on the beach. <laughs> okay. Well, I had the mountain on. You know, I've been to the other two. Uh, what, Ben Nevis and, uh, yeah, and um, Scarfell. Scarfell? Yes. Yeah. Fell, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dang. All right. Well, we'll talk mountains later. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. All right. So any other questions right now or should we kind of move on? Great. 
move on okay. all right now move look at, i'm not i'm not going to take take any effect if you if you all you know if you get right if your head exploding you can check out and and you know come back or, or whatever uh but uh, okay I, I will not i will not take that as an offense or personally at all okay let's go back to share all right so haiku you know haiku is an imagistic form and here's the word see if i can shrink this a little bit no all right Uh, can you see the word juxtaposition? Is that showing up mm -hmm. on your? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. That is a great word. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, students, do you remember that word? Yes. All right, million dollar word. It'll be on the SAT test if you're if they still have them by the time you become seniors. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so this happened years ago, and uh, you know, I said to the kids, uh, these might have been ninth graders. I taught up north for a while, and uh, said, you know, all I want you to do is go out and 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 be an observer. You know, uh, of, be, you know, of images, things that go together in an interesting way. So we're going to do this. Uh, this is kind of fun. I, I like doing this. It's probably lame, but I'm going to try it anyway. So uh, here's how juxtaposition works in haiku. So you need you need to put both of your hands up. Okay, so whatever you're holding, put them down, and this is this is really fun. All right, so so you got you know you got two images, right? Left hand, right hand. Okay, so mm -hmm. haiku is juxtaposing two images in an interesting way. Fold your fingers. Okay, now you just juxtapose two images, but it's not a haiku yet because it's the same old, same old. But watch what happens if you take your fingers and just shift them left or right, and then refold your hands. A little awkward. Isn't well, it? How, does that, how does that feel? Different. Yeah, different, odd, unfamiliar. Right. So here's here's one of the keys to haiku. The haiku poet does not try to deal with with you know, it deals with the everyday. We're mm -hmm. not looking for the extraordinary in life. We're looking for the everyday occurrences. Those things all around us or inside of us that we haven't been as aware, aware of as we should, and we simply put them together in an interesting way. And that's sort of the product of language, observation and language. You know, they both work to put things together in a way that's slightly different. Uh, haiku poets refer to that as the aha moment. This is, you know, whatever, I've done this a million times before. This is, aha, isn't that different? Why haven't I done that before? Why haven't I seen the world quite in that interesting juxtaposition? Here's another way to do it, okay? Everybody give yourself a big hug. Big hug. Oh, I love me, right? Okay, now what? Take your arms now and shift them and hug yourself the other way. Mm. Oh my God, I'm with a stranger. Mm. You know, <laughs> isn't that different? Just, yeah. di just different enough to say, well, <laughs> yeah. And and uh, anyway, I think that's a neat way to kind of explain haiku. So I, I said to the kid, this uh, students go out and just make an observation about the world around. I don't want you to write a haiku yet. And one kid came in and he said, well, I saw a little bird hopping across a parking lot. And his classmates laughed. Stupid, I used the S word, right? That's stupid. And I said, well, wait, wait, let's hold on there for a minute. Let's take a look at that observation. So what are the two images? Lily, you want to throw them out there? What are the two images? The bird hopping and the parking lot. Thank you, uh, Henry. Bird in a parking lot. Okay, so let's take a look at those images for, for a minute. Uh, are those comparative or contrasting images? Contrasting. Yeah. Contrasting. Little and large. Li okay, so let's let's see. Let's start with there. Little and large. Little bird, big parking lot. Uh, what other ways are they contrasting? Little and large. Yeah, little and large. What else? One's, a, li one's a living thing, and one's um, an inanimate. Not an object exactly, but okay. little and large, uh, animate, inanimate, living and inanimate. Okay. Natural and man made. Yeah. yeah. Soft, yeah. rich, and hard. Natural so, and man made. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the observation is really worth, worth its weight in gold. And, and what I said to the kid was I probably walked by that same scene a hundred times and failed to recognize it. You know, so I think that's an interesting juxtaposition. And speaking of juxtaposition, when you write your haiku, you're going to juxtapose images. And one of the things you want to be aware of 
is whether or not the images you, you have juxtaposed are comparative or contrastive. Okay. So this first poem written by Gary Hotham uh, a number of years ago, uh, yeah, I think he's Canadian. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Gary Hotham is up, from, is up, uh, up in Canada, up in Toronto maybe. Um, Freshly fallen snow, opening a new package of typing paper. Now this one's a little bit dated, but I think it stands up. I think it's a beautiful haiku, especially for those of us who are a little bit older, when, back in the days when we still use typewriters, right? So what two images come together? Who's got, who's got the a what? The whiteness of the snow and the whiteness of the paper. Yeah, uh, and the answer of course is, are they comparative or contrasting? They're comparative, I think. Yeah, yeah. they're very comparative images, right? Yeah. Right, freshly fallen snow open. So what, what else about that is comparative? You know, how about the language? What language kind of com is comparative? What words? Freshly and new. Freshly and new. Freshly and new, okay? So I think it's a wonderful observation that points to newness, to freshness, the beginning of something. Um, I don't know who was it mentioned, uh, was it uh, Sean or somebody said something about metaphor? So, so metaphor sometimes kind of grows out of haiku. It shouldn't be our intent, but it can happen. Um, what's gonna happen to the snow, provided it doesn't melt, what's gonna happen to the snow as the day progresses? Gonna get messed up. Gonna get messed up. People are gonna walk on it. What's gonna to happen to the typing paper? Same thing. You start writing, it's never as perfect as before you put the first word down. The, the yeah, torture the first, of being a writer. Yeah, as soon as you put the first word to the page, you're doomed, right? Right. right. Yeah, yeah. It's all it's over. And so this is a haiku that sp speaks to to freshness, to newness, a moment in time when things are pristine. Be before before they're trod on, tampered with. I think it's a beautiful observation. Also, the connection of prints. Oh my gosh, yeah. Did it, Angie, did you say that? Prints in the snow and key prints on the paper. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so the, you know, the, the symbolism, the metaphor, whatever it is, you know, the abstraction, the abstract thought kind of uh, is a product of the haiku, but it isn't the haiku. In fact, that's really important to know. The haiku, you know, uh, there's there's a, a line um, I think it was Basho, the, the the you know the the old the old Japanese guy in the 1650s, right? Um, he you know he talks about the suchness of things. You know, he said to know the pine, go to the pine. It's got to be what it is. You know, we don't want to deal with abstractions in any any way, shape, or fashion. Here's one that's just I think disarming in its in its simplicity. Hot night, turning the pillow to the cool side. How many of you have done that? <laughs> yeah. So there's a beautiful haiku with contrasting images. You know, hot and cold, right? Uh, turn, turning the pillow. Um, you know. Uh, so by extension, what's going to happen to the pillow after you've slept on it a little while? You know, yeah. it's going to get warm. Yeah. And you're going to flip it again. You know, mm -hmm. this repetition, you know, the cycle that we go through to get through a hot night. And uh, it's something that I've done a million times, uh, but, but Cor Vanden Heuvel had the sensibility, the haiku sensibility to actually pause and, 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 and write it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep, keep a haiku, keep a notebook next to your, your, your bed at night um, and jot down words and phrases. Phrases. Mm -hmm. My experience is, is the vast majority of those turn out to be uh, some form of idiocy in the morning, but occasionally you come up with something that that is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting or pretty stark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, here's another this kind of one has the word turning in it as well, which the idea of turning the pillow, but it's also what we do on a hot night. We toss and turn. Angie, Angie, you're ready to do it. You're, Angie's going to do workshop part two. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, no, please don't. No, no I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, you. Yeah, no, that's the exact kind of thing. You know, I love to hear that. Um, for all of you, um, and, I, and I'll say this, you know, shout out to Elizabeth and Lily and some of the other students. One of the greatest joys I get in doing this is every year the students come up with something 
the, a, a rendering or interpretation of a poem, not to mention their own work, which helps me to see the world in a new or different way. But they'll see something in a poem that I, I, I'd missed. And that's just delightful. You know, you say, well, how could I, how could I have not seen that, right? So yeah, so haiku should be a group activity. If you, if you don't have a haiku group in your community, see if you can get one started. So mm -hmm. here we go, haiku, something about haiku. Haiku shows it does not tell. So one of the things you want to be very careful of is, is you know, sort of in the Western tradition, we, we, we tend to kind of reach a conclusion for our reader. A haiku should avoid either telling the reader how you feel or telling the reader how to feel. Mm -hmm. So if we were giving a, a haiku party and this walked into my room, I'd stop it at the door and I'd do a checklist. I'd say, okay, your three lines you're fewer than 10 words, you're fewer than 17 syllables. Eh, you're not two parts, but I might let you get away with that. But, the, but, but no, you can't come in because you're, you're, you're telling me too much. So go out and reinvent yourself. So if you find yourself making a statement that's sort of feeling based, that's a good key to you that that's where you wanna get your reader to go. You want to get your reader to say, I was sad when I saw the dead cat. So why, check this poem out. Well, you can't because I, I haven't. Okay, here we go. Michael McClintock, look at this poem. Yeah. Somebody read it for me. I want to hear this one. Who's got it? Dead cat, open mouth to the pouring rain. <sighs> Heaven forbid. So watch, I, I'm not a cat lover. I'm not a cat lover, oh. <laughs> but I'm going the wrong direction. I can conclude, I, I, I'm sad when I see that dead cat. Mm. I'm sad when I see that dead cat. That cat open mouth to the pouring rain, you know? Isn't that, isn't that something? So that's, that's a perfect example of show not tell. Paint the picture with words. Try to try to evoke the, the 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 emotional response in your reader. Now, a couple of other things I wanted to say about this poem. You know, I think I think it's uh, it, it, it I think it can disarm. I think it's it's very complex poem. I mean, the first question I have is whose mouth is opened? Yeah, that's what I saw. The the watcher oh. would be oh, this is a dead cat. How many of you see the dead cat's mouth open? I, that's the first thing I saw. How many of you see the, the viewer's mouth open? I saw one, then the other. Both. Yeah. They're both, both credible, aren't they? I mean, yeah. sometimes when we see a startling scene, we, our mouth agape, you know, we almost look up. Oh, my God. Mm. You know? Uh, but the other thing with the, the, the most successful haiku have the power to do is the poet knows what they can successfully leave out. And I think this is a perfect example of, of Michael McClintock having a sense of what to leave out. So my, my, my uh, belief is that he never tells us where the dead cat is because we will see the cat somewhere in our mind's eye. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, Anna, do you see the cat? Where would you, where would you see it? Um, yeah, laying down by the Seine River where I walk and I find dead animals often. But um, for here in France, that would be dead hedgehog yeah <laughs> open mouth to the <laughs> well, yeah. people are very careful with their cats but they're running over hedgehogs here all the time um yeah dead animals are always very strong images for me i'm an animal lover and i'm always sad i'm almost more sad than you know i should be but um yeah 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 it's, it's down along the river yeah where i walk sure. does anybody see the cat in another location on this sort of dirt path outdoors. Yeah, yeah path in an alley. You know, mm -hmm. one gets it on an athletic field. I mean, you know, so the so I think I think sometimes the question is what can I successfully leave out? You know, I can mm -hmm. I can have some faith that my my re reader is going to fill in the missing the missing piece. Oh. Yeah. Questions? No, that's that's the first time I've heard someone say that. What can I leave? out and leave to the reader's imagination. Tom, thank you. I'm taking that little nugget with me.
Yeah. Well, Anna, we get, you know, it, we may not have time today and we'll see where this goes. We, uh, depending on what, you know, R Robin and Henry and, and uh, Sean, those guys want to do. Um, we can probably, well, we can probably figure it out. I have a whole revision workshop which I think is really, really useful. And, and it asks some essential questions. So what I, where I use that is I apply it to myself. I have a thing called haiku in progress. I have a whole bunch of poems that I'm kind of, I'm different phase stages of evolution. And I know the kids did that. Lily, uh, Elizabeth, you remember? Yes. We, we would have you just write a lot, a lot of haiku. In yeah. fact, um, for those, uh, for just for a uh, Robin and 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 Henry, you know, I mean, the kids have generally done well, but Elizabeth or uh, Lily, um, just venture a guess. How many? Well, I'm going to say the word bad because there's nothing bad. But how many bad haiku did you have to write before you got a real good one? Uh, um. Well, for me at least, I feel like it was kind of like it varied, but. I was surprised on how many like bad haikus it took to get like one that was able to either turn into something that could be good or that was good. But I'd probably say like 10 or like 20. It took me a while to finally get one that kind of like I was proud of. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How about you, Lily? Did you, did you find yourself writing a lot of sort of subpar ones? Yeah, I found myself writing like most of mine were bad until I got one that I had to work on to make it good. Yeah, uh, girls, I'm really glad you said that. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that too. I write a lot of really bad haiku. They're in that thing called haiku in progress. Most of those will never see the light of day, you know? But, and I let them linger there for, for just so long before I kick them out of the party, you know? But I think we've got to give ourselves permission to, to write a lot of, you know, subpar haiku. And then, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be in a group, uh, uh, you know, and you can critique and talk about one another's work, I mean, that's really, really helpful, you know. Uh, I will share with you that uh, we did a, with the kids a lot, of, a lot of critiquing in class, remember? We would use that whiteboard and put yes. palms up. Yes. Yeah, and we always did it anonymously. And then the kids could talk about the palms, you know, what they saw, what they might, you know, do, do, do the same or differently. And uh, I don't know, girls, if you knew this, but every once in a while, uh, I would slip a palm of mine in. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it was all anonymous. So I had one I've been working on, and I put it up there, and some of them got, like, raked over the coals, you know? And yeah. in, a, in a very meaningful way. Nobody was, nobody was disrespectful or... or, or so, uh, so, uh, so I have a, a small point to make. Uh, the word pouring rain, I, I don't know, immediately thought about a purring cat. You have a word like purring. And I don't know whether the, whether the poet had thought about it. If it's because cats purr. Oh, the purring and the pouring. Yeah, 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 pu yeah. purring cat and pouring rain. I don't know, that immediately came to my mind. You know, purring cat is a live cat, lively cat. But yeah. pouring rain and purring cat, you know, I think that that word, that I, I feel there is something associated with pouring and purring, which yeah. says about the dead cat and a live cat, you know. That, I don't know, I felt it so. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, Suresh, so, so again, if you've got your notebook, I would write that down. You know, those are two interesting words, you know, purring and pouring. And, and I dare say there's probably been, well, again, I mentioned earlier, Charlie Trumbull. Remember the, uh, the editor who published Billy Collins' 575 poem and, and it won an award and I was chagrined. Well, the other thing that uh, Sh Charlie Trumbull has done is he, he, uh, he's, he's a brilliant man. He started an international haiku database for any, he, and he's been collecting every haiku ever published in English since back in the day, probably going back to the early 1950s. And his database has uh, tens of thousands of haiku that have been published. And in fact, uh, it's been a real resource for me. I'll give you an example. If I were to email Charlie and say, Charlie, would you send me a selection of cat haiku? Simply, he would type into the database the word cat. And here's what he would tell me. I have no doubt. He would say, how many, how many thousand do you want? <laughs> And, and I've made the mistake before. I remember saying, you know, I'd like, I'd like a haiku with the word moon in them, in it, right? And he, he said, how many thousand? And I said, jokingly, well, just send me your first 500. And I got him almost instantly. <laughs> and then felt obligated to read through them, right? 
But, but so, uh, uh, Shresh, every subject is fair game and no subject can be overwritten. It's just a matter of finding a new way. So the, the pouring rain, the purring cat, boy, I'm almost seeing now a contrast, you know, the purring cat is indoors or outdoors. I'd like to interject something here. Yeah. Um, and Nick Regilio famously wrote many, many versions of poems that he did not publish. And um, they can be accessed now at the Robeson Library, the Nick Regilio haiku uh, database. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like what Charlie's done, but it's, it's about Nick's process, which I think is useful uh, if you're uh, writing haiku to see how he came upon certain things. Yeah, I think that I think the process is fascinating, you know, and, and again, I would, you know, again, go back to the kids. I, I, it's fascinating not only with their, their way of writing and rendering the world, but how they got there, you know, right. not, not necessarily to do it to people do it the same way. So here's a quick review of the rules. OK, haiku is haiku is usually for short, fewer than 10 words. Haiku does not rhyme. 17 or fewer syllables, 11 to 13 seems to be about ideal. Uh, most often written in three lines. Avoid simile. So simile, you know, using the word like or as, you occasionally find it, but but that's a metaphor. So so I would encourage you to stay away from it. Direct metaphor. Uh, but a little a little alliteration is lovely. Just a little alliteration. Now don't overdo it. Okay. A little alliteration. A little alliteration is okay. I'm gonna, so there's a wonderful article that I can get to written by Michael Dylan Welsh uh, about why no 575. And, and I'm not a native speaker of Japanese. I've been to Japan twice and I know enough just to stay out of trouble. Uh, generally, you know, sumimasen, if you apologize your way through the country, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I could say, you know, some greetings, some, some good mornings and so on. Um, so why not 17 in English? I, I think it's worth kind of looking at this real, real quickly. So um, this is a very watered down explanation, but it works for most people. Um, so the, the, you know, the equivalent in Japanese, the, the, the sound unit, uh, we have syllables, they have, a, 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 it's called on, O-N, and each on lasts the same duration of time to utter. So if you ever listen to a, a, a native speaker of Japanese or someone who speaks Japanese, notice how the language sounds. So I'll, I'll say the one phrase I really uh, got down, I think over there, uh, um, ohayo gozaimasu, ohayo gozaimasu. I said, good morning to you in Japanese, ohayo gozaimasu. So you notice how the language kind of sounds clipped, almost like uh, you know little karate chops, chopping you know, onions or something, right? Ohio goes I must. So Ohio goes I. So that's in English, that would be seven syllables. Mm -hmm. Same utterance in English is only three syllables. Good morning. So, so equivalent words and phrases, the Japanese tend to use a lot more, uh, more syllables for the same word. But there's a better way, I think, to explain it without getting really too, too, too murky about this. Um, Haiku traditionally has been described or, or defined as a one breath poem. A one breath poem, it's, 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 you know, it's a very brief utterance. And so it should be, maybe, maybe it's a mystery, but it, for me, you know, it, it, it became pretty clear that 17 Japanese on or syllables fit perfectly into one conversational breath. And since every Japanese on like, lasts the same duration of a time to say, any one breath <clears throat> poem would be 17 on. Does that make sense? So there's a, yep. un there's a uniformity to it. So uh, just, you know, to yourself or on, uh, you know, um, so I can hear you. When I say go, you're going to say uh, good morning three times. You're going to say, oh, hi, gozaimasu, oh, hi, gozaimasu, oh, hi, gozaimasu, in one breath. All right, just try that. Ready, set, go. Very comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's Ohio goes I imas. Seven syllables, three times. How many syllables did we use? Twenty-one. Japanese. Twenty-one. Okay, and we could we you know we basically squeeze that into one breath conversationally. Now watch what happens with English because English, unlike Japanese, on English comes in short syllables like the word inappropriate. So let's say the word inappropriate three times. 
inappropriate, inappropriate, inappropriate. inappropriate. We just use inappropriate 15 syllables, yeah. pretty close to 17, isn't it? So, but that was one breath. But watch what happens when we use a one syllable word in English like through. Mm -hmm. what so we're gonna say through conversationally, we're counting them on our fingers, say it 15 times conversationally when I say go. On your mark, it's that go. Through, 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 through. Through, 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 through. I'm running out of breath. You see what's happening? Yeah, I run out of yeah. breath. You're mm -hmm. we're way out of breath, and we've just written a great. And then on the, it's more like War and Peace, right? We just wrote yeah. a novel. This thing extended way over the edges, and and it's it feels weighty, too you know too long, and so. The, you know, that's where the approximation 1113 comes down. If you take a, a English language syllables and kind of average them and try to keep that brevity, that one breath kind of notion in place, uh, th that's how the 113 syllables comes up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's an easy explanation. It gets more complicated. And I'll send you Michael Dillon Walsh's article. Okay. Um, real quick, where's the break in these? So haiku is a two-part poem. Haiku is a two-part mm -hmm. poem, and we don't need punctuation necessarily, although I will say that you are free to use punctuation. We'll look at some, uh, some poems later on that, that use even question marks, but generally no punctuation is needed if you want the poem to flow and, and the break is suggested it simply by the, the, the construction of the words. If you want to, to direct your reader to a short pause, I would suggest use ellipsis three little dots, mm -hmm. which says to your reader, just pause a second or two more here. And if you want a more abrupt pause, or if it's not really clear, then you might want to use a dash, mm -hmm. okay? So look at this poem, another wave, the seaweed still clings to the driftwood. Where, where's, where's the break between part one and part two? Who's got that one for me? Wave and a seaweed. Yeah, mm -hmm. another, yeah, yeah. Can you feel the pause? Another wave. The seaweed still clings to the driftwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, comparative or contrasting images? There's a loaded question. What do you think? Comparative. Yeah. What's com what do you think is comparative? Is it Elizabeth? Yes. Um, I feel like wave and seaweed. It kind of makes you think of the ocean. Yeah, that's good. I did no. There you go. I didn't see that, Elizabeth. I was going to say contrasting because the seaweed's alive and moving, and the driftwood is dead. But you know what? It could be both, couldn't it? Mm. Fantastic. So, Elizabeth, believe it or not, we didn't we didn't plan this. Right in that moment, Elizabeth saw this poem differently than I did, and I'm already thinking, well, this is a day well lived. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I, I, I've suddenly seen something that I'm really familiar with. I've seen it in a different light. Oh, my gosh. You know, we can never live too long. My, oh, my. How about this one? Autumn wind, louder and louder, the rattle of leaves. Where would you put the break in this one? Well, I love that I could put it either place. They right. work for me in different ways. Right. So some, yeah. you know, some haiku lend themselves to that. It's really up to the reader. And I think the poet was well served not putting punctuation in there because it does give us some room to maneuver. How different it is. Autumn wind, pause, louder and louder, the rattle of leaves. Or autumn wind, louder and louder, the rattle of leaves, you know. Mm -hmm. So one of the things when I uh, look at a haiku, when I write my own or when I read, uh, see another one, I always read it out loud. And a, a good thing to do with your haiku is uh, after you've you know worked on them a while, have someone read them to you. Have somebody read the poem to you. Okay. You could also read that one with a break in the middle. Talk. Uh, the line. Tell me about that. Autumn wind louder and louder the rattle of leaves. Oh, oh my God! There's two surprises. <laughs> mm -mm. Man, I'm really glad I came to this workshop. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's, ex I've never, who, who was that? Is that Angie again? Yeah, that was me. Oh, I was gonna yeah. keep quiet. <laughs> Angie, you're, you're stealing all my fire. Good God. <laughs> Go for it. That's wonderful. I've never thought of, Autumn went louder 
and louder the rattle of leaves. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Three places, three possible places. Three possible places, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, Angie, I'm going to steal that. And the next time I I throw this one at the kids, you know, I'm going to pretend I've known it all along. (laughs) Very good. All right. So often haiku is a single line afternoon haze followed by two lines that may be a, you know, a short sentence or phrase. Autumn haze, the slow wind up of a cicada. Boy, can't you feel that? You know, the heat and those cicadas, once one gets going, it starts them all, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Let's see if I can do this without messing up. This is also true when the structure is one line, two line. This is one of my favorite all time haiku and I wish I had written it. Coming Mm. home, the house, so many stars. So many mm-hmm. stars. So here's here's the question I would ask: uh, Where is where is the the poet, the viewer uh, at this point? Where's that moment? In, where are they at that moment in time? Where do you see them? I see them. I walk walk yeah, Jennifer, where do you see them? I see them either standing outside, or perhaps there is, um, you know, what is it called? The window that's in the ceiling. Skylight. Skylight. Maybe standing under a skylight. Maybe under a skylight. Yeah. How many of you see them outside? Maybe uh, on the on the front porch or something, or something. Trying just before. Yeah. I think I'll I'll see them outside. Mm -hmm. Comparative or contrasting images. Well, I think. Karen, what do you got? Karen. Oh, you're muted, Karen. I have comparing the emptiness of the of of the universe and the empty house. Okay. Um, anybody else see see it as contrasting? I see. I see the, yeah, I see the sky as full of stars and the house empty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's in the viewer's mind's eye whether you see that universe is empty or whether you see that the sky is full of stars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Either way, isn't it an interesting, just a moment mm-hmm. in time, you know? So I'd ask myself, how many times have I entered the house and not paused long enough, you know? And so a good, a good thing to do as a haiku poet is anytime you're in, in, in transition, transition to places to stop and look around. And, I, and some of those can be very simple. The, like when you leave one room to go to the next, when you step outdoors, when you go to get out of your car, you know, transition moments are often, you know, there for the taking with, with haiku. Something's going on. You know, this this haiku means more to some people than others. Um, if you've never been out in the dark country, if you've yeah. never seen the Milky Way, if you've never seen this much dark sky, I can see where we would have kids who grew up in the city who've never been to summer camp. Um, wouldn't understand what he means. So many stars. There's about ten stars up there every night. You know. And um, yeah, that's interesting. And, and I think that's a. I think that's a really, really um, um, a keen, um, you know, observation about how different that poem can be depending on where yeah. it's grown up. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. never stopped to think about that either. You know, because I have a reference point. You know, I grew up in an Me area. Too. Where you know, there were relatively, there's relatively little light pollution. Mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. say I could step out of my of my house here or enter my house here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. That, right? Yeah, yeah. So describe what you have seen, heard, touched, tasted, smelled today that typically happens this time of year in nature. Include weather and the time of day in your description. So be an observer of the outdoors, right? This is, uh, girls, do you know Carolina? Carolina, yeah. yeah. So we had we had like the, the, the you know the, the terror not the terrible trio. There was Lily and Elizabeth, and then then the the their other their sidekick was Carolina Harden, and uh, she couldn't be here today. But you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Carolina did this did this drawing to illustrate mm-hmm. the seasonality. So a thing we you, you would want to do seasonally is a thing called it's called a ginkgo. Have you ever heard that word before? Yeah. yeah. Ginkgo or haiku walk, you know, and the best thing to do with ginkgo is simply to make sure you go alone, don't talk, 
and take a walk and, and just, you know, pause long enough to take in your surroundings, jot down, you know, words, phrases, things. Um, 52 of us did one um, just over a week ago with Carla Ramesh, all in our own, our own uh, you know, um, vicinity. And then we all came back on Zoom and we shared. Fantastic, yeah. Wow. Quick, uh, quick interjection for uh, Nick Virgilio Haiku Association. We have a Ginkgo Walk series and you can watch uh, on YouTube. Uh, oh, throughout cool. Camden. Fantastic. Each of them is partially narrated and then partly in silence so you can think your own thoughts as you observe and then there's a workshop after on some of them. Yeah so you know if, if, if you you know if you like companionship um, you know to go on a, go on a ginkgo walk with, with, with some friends and just you know um, agree that you're not going to talk and when you get back you're going to you know compare some notes and, and see what, what you uh, what you came up with. We did one, at a, a workshop at Rutgers once where we didn't have very far to go and it wasn't much real nature. We would say you walk outside the building and you walk around the courtyard and back, but we did it blind. So one person guided uh, uh, the blind person around and then on the way back, the formerly blind person guided the other person. And so it eliminated the sight but it was it was pungent enough for people to write poetry from because of that. Yeah, uh, Henry, Henry, that that just reminds me, you know. So one of the things I really am um, somewhat passionate about is uh, is bird watching. You know. Yeah. I, I could I could tell you how many North American species of birds that I've seen. The girls probably know, but uh, as my wife said, you know, I could be making it up, so why bother, right? But, mm -hmm. but, but the fact is, is that uh, this, what Henry, what you just said reminded me that uh, when I was living up in Rochester, New York, there was a, a man in the uh, Rochester Birding Association. He, he was legally blind. And uh, we, you know, he, we, there was a very sort of a hot spot, birding hot spot called Island Cottage Woods. And we, we, he would go over with us and he would sit on a log and, and he would sit there and he'd say, you know, over there is a you know, blue winged warbler. Oh, oh, you know, there, there's, oh, down low, there, you know, there's a hermit thrush, and this would be in the springtime, and uh, so one of the things, Henry, you're talking about, you know, blindfolding is you go out sometime, uh, rather than walk, just go out in the nature and, and close your eyes, and, and don't look around, you know, and, and uh, you know, so kind of, kind of key in or hone in on one or two senses that, that maybe, you know, take, don't take precedence. Uh, or some of the time. So when you go outside, um, here we go. So Henry mentioned this, uh, haiku traditionally follow the seasons and have a kigo or season word. So the word kigo means a word or phrase, right? There's a book, I'm gonna grab it here. These books are kind of hard to come by now. Um, you probably pay a, a fairly, paid, pretty penny on Amazon. It's called the Haiku World and Inter International Poetry Almanac. And it's by uh, William J. Higginson, who passed mm -hmm. away maybe a decade or two ago. And this is, so the Japanese have a book called the Saijiki. And in a Saijiki, it's a list of seasonal words and phrases that are that are common to, to, to the language and to, you know, people agree, agree upon that are anchored mm -hmm. in a particular season. This book is uh, Higginson's attempt to create one uh, for, for North America. And it's a really wonderful resource. And, and in fact, in traditional haiku and Japanese haiku, you would almost be, you would be required to, to pick a word or phrase from the sajiki that clearly anchored the poem in, in a, a particular season. So if you, it's a haiku world, an international poetry almanac by, by Higginson. I think you can still find these occasionally on Amazon. Uh, I, I search eBay once in a while. I haven't had any luck, but this is a really wonderful resource. So he'll give you a whole list of seasonal words and phrases and then break them down uh, one by one and tell you what the significance of them is and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what they mean. Okay. Uh, so what I would do um, is... One of the things you can do is begin just simply keep a list of uh, the, the the seasons, the four seasons, not to be uh, not to be confused with Frankie Valley and you know the <laughs> right. You date yourself when you say that. 
There you uh, go. And just begin to, you know, keep, keep a list of words. Uh, and here's something you, you're probably aware of, but in haiku, uh, there's a fifth season. And the fifth season is considered the new, new year or the days immediately before and just after is treated separately. So, so traditionally, we would, all, we would all write a new year haiku. <laughs> time or another. Okay. So let's talk about seasonality. Um, I, I think what I'll do is I'll just call on people. And if you want to pass, you can. So um, one of the things about seasonality with haiku is that, uh, of course, re, you know, the regions are different. I know I moved to Atlanta 10 years ago, and I'm still not in sync with the weather and, and you know, how things don't manifest themselves in the same way they did when I was up north, especially winter, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a little bit of regional sort of different interpretation, but how about this one? Uh, let's see, Karen, a cold moon, uh, the black cat shadow slips in with the rain. What season do you associate that with? Um, winter. Winter. Karen, winter? winter. Okay. How about the darkness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, winter. Um, anybody else get a different season from it? I would say I late, would say late autumn. autumn. Late yeah, August. I was going to say fall. Yes. Fall. Early spring. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was in the early spring camp. Yeah. Yeah. I guess this one depends a lot on your, your own personal experience, right? With, the, with that. Okay. Let's look at this one. See if this one. Uh, evening rain, road pavement releases the day's heat. How about uh, Angie? What do you think about that one? For me, that's definitely some of the day's heat. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous haiku. Uh, Halloween, my feelings, oh, oh, it's this one, right? Yeah, I guess it says it all, doesn't it? it does. yeah. Especially this year. Yeah, picking petals, mm -hmm. she loves him enough to cheat. Oh! Ooh, Robin, okay. That's what cute. What season? <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, Robin, what season do you say? Uh, summer. Summer? Yeah. Spring. Spring. Spring, summer. Spring. Yeah, where attention's turned to love. I just love that. I just can, I can imagine it, right? I think it's clearly spring because of the love and yeah. uh, well, the petals are the first ones you see. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. The lusty month of May. <laughs> I just love the way the last line hit me and I'm reading along. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice, yeah. Like, a nice seasonal summer. Yeah. In the park. Yeah. In the park. yeah. Fourth of July. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite all time haiku. Um, and uh, Pamela Miller Ness, um, who, uh, who used to be really active in the um, uh, Haiku Society of America, she was a former president of the Haiku Society of America and since kind of moved on to some other things. Uh, she lived in New York City with her husband. And, and this one to me, this is a perfect example of a haiku that it can extend to, to metaphor. So New Year's rain, so there's a New Year haiku, the circles in the puddle widen. And I want you just to think about that image for a minute. You know, if you can imagine a drop of rain falling into the puddle, I mean, what happens, right? The, 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 the circles widen, they move out from the center. Mm -hmm. And there's something to me metaphorical about, but that, that's kind of after January 1st, what happens to the year, you know? Mm -hmm. you know yeah, you yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the year kind of, and then and then it disappears, and you need you need another drop in the puddle, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into it, but it's always felt like you know it could be an extended, you know, you could extend that into a metaphor, pretty pretty mm -hmm. nicely. Mm -hmm. This one I really like the the olfactory smell, morning mist, uh, the church fills with the smell of overcoats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, very nice. Isn't that nice? Yeah. yeah. And this one actually I wrote, and probably if you don't know the story, you, you may not, you know, get get that. Years on the weight of pennies in the mason jar. So you don't know I just, mason I just noticed jar. something about your initials too. Huh? What's your that? Initials. <laughs> what about my initials? Well, TP, I, I don't want to actually, I don't have to say it, I don't think. Do toilet, I, paper. Uh, toilet paper. Toilet paper. paper. <laughs> Henry, Henry. <laughs> I've been called far yeah. worse things. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you could stick with the toilet paper image to imagine what those are. Never mind. All right. 
We can cut that out, Sean. Okay. Uh, so years <laughs> end. So, you know, for many of us haiku have a story. So my son, you know, Philip, the one that went to college, he was a little boy in, in, his, in his grandmother's house. She had mason jars in the basement. And she used to, you know, we were kids can't can fruit, but they long since stopped doing that. And he wanted one of the jars. And so she gave it to him. He had one of those wonderful snap on lids, you know, mm -hmm. and we took it home and he said, dad, what are we going to do with this? And I said, what do you say we put it on the mantle? And this was, we were there over the, you know, the, like the, the winter holiday, Christmas, right? <laughs> and uh, I said, why don't we start putting pennies in, in it? And then next year, mm -hmm. see if we can fill it. And next year, we'll count the pennies. And we did mm -hmm. that faithfully over the course of the year. And the moment for me, the haiku moment was when, you know, the next year rolled around and he went to get that jar. And, and the first thing he said was, dad, it's so heavy you know <laughs> so heavy it was just anyway so here we go um people in haiku i can't i have a hard let's see if i can move this thing i got this bar up here and we can see we can, can somebody we can read that it. for me who marabin will you read that for me People in haiku, people being part of nature, are also excellent subjects for your poems. Be alert to human moments, both serious and humorous, where the essence of being human is made manifest. There you go. So senru are haiku poems that simply do not depend on nature image. So can I, may I share one more? So this is mine too, to toilet paper. Um, and, and this one actually, I was doing a haiku workshop with some really little kids. I, I'm thinking they were second grade or something. And uh, they're tough to work with, right? But I was doing, so you know those old, those things, paint by number sets? Mm -hmm. Did you ever use those when you were a kid? Or yep. you yeah. still do, right? So we were, there's a workshop you can do actually with paint by number and haiku and anyway. So I had the kids, these little paint by number things. And this one kid, there was a, there was like a stream or a river and, and he was, he was going, he was not, you know, he was going right outside the lines and I couldn't figure out whether he was doing it on purpose mm -hmm. or, or whether he was intentionally breaking the rules, you know? And, and I actually was kind of uplifting when I thought that this little guy was probably breaking the rules on purpose. <laughs> I'm not going to stay within the lines. You know, so paint by number, the child's river escapes its bank, spoke to me of sort of the, maybe the risk taking of childhood or the, the little renegade, you know? Yeah. So, when, but the bottom line in the story is when I asked him about, uh, uh, you know, the river, he wouldn't answer me, but he did say, but do you want to know why I painted the river red? And I said, why is that? And this, this is where it got trouble. And he said, cause it's blood. <laughs> and that's when wow. we moved on okay <laughs> yeah, I, had this, I had him pegged right first love my best friend's bike at her house Ooh. <gasps> oh, oh, ouch. Oh, ouch. Ouch. ouch thank you if you can get your reader to feel something you've done your work right mm -hmm. now some some folks back in the day would have argued and said well this is not a senru it's a haiku because it would have to be spring or summertime. Love, first love. But first love, right? Or bicycle. Mm. Bicycle, but you the know. In the house, it's not outdoors. It could be any time. Could be any time. Yeah. And, and since I moved to Atlanta, I've, I've discovered I can ride my bicycle here 12 months of the year, mm. right? So, but, but, so I, I would say it, it tends to be more senru. It's more about human nature. In nature, but I don't think we need to argue. I think it's just a really disarming poem. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. 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 Um, let's go to this one. Cereal box, this toy submarine at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so both of you who don't know, there's another name out. Stanford Forrester. I just talked to him the other day. Uh, in fact, uh, the kids in class, we called him. We were doing this poem in, in class. Lily, did we call him when you guys were here? I think so, yeah. Yeah, we would make periodic phone calls to haiku poets and, you know, get them out of bed in the morning, right? <laughs> so we called Stanford Forrester the other day just to uh, to talk to him about this poem. And he said, he got, boy, he started talking about this. You think I talk a lot. And he was saying, yeah, back in the day, they put the toy in there and there was this one company, they put yeah. a little, little gray submarine that you put baking soda in and his daughters would, would fight over it. But I think the story aside, uh, what works about the poem? What, how, how does it work? I mean, the bottom well, of this thing. Yeah, yeah, this is the story. 
Yeah. So submarines go to the bottom of things. And, yeah. And, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. and the fact that they actually did that and, and you mm -hmm. know, if it was a toy horse, it wouldn't work nearly as, as well. Uh, Mr. Forrester, he does bottle rockets. Is that Mr. correct? Mr. Forrester, Stan uh, yeah. Forrester does bottle rockets. Okay. Yeah, he, he's, uh, oh, let me go back here. I'm going the okay. wrong way. Uh, okay. So, yeah, Stan Forrester does bottle rockets. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's up in, uh, in Connecticut. He's, he's a great guy. And, uh, yeah. So spend a little time with this one. Um, nursing home, the man in a wheelchair near the parrot cage. Yeah, Elizabeth. Well, I mean, what I kind of notice is nursing homes can sometimes be kind of lonely. Mm -hmm. I guess parrots repeat mm -hmm. what people say. So it's kind of like him talking to the parrot. That's why Maybe. he's by the cage. I think, I think. They're also both feeling trapped. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wheel, wheelchair and parrot cage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you all put it all together and I think I think you really unlock the you know the meaning of this wow. poem and um, you so you, you, you know I didn't know about haiku but I worked in a nursing home when I was in high school and nights uh, after school and on weekends and I can tell you I probably walked by situations uh, similar to this and on many occasions but didn't have the sense to kind of slow down and, 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 and observe you know mm. I, I think also for me the wheel chair is normally one word certainly in England mm. so I could then have a break between the wheel and the chair mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ma so nursing home the man in a wheel chair near the parrot cage yeah mm. Mm. right right I see mm. this I wonder I wonder I'm going to have to go back and look at this I don't think I think this is the way I don't think I, I typed this one wrong I think it was I I see that the the man is sort of nursing the parrot so that he feels like yeah. he's not completely out of control. That's good. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And he understands how the parrot feels. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think what's what's interesting is that you know we could a, a poem like this can spark a lot of discussion, mm -hmm. and you know there are several interpretations, but it really does I think work on so many levels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's terrible <laughs> there you go so so that's funny it's terrible but we're laughing i know <laughs> it's, yeah it, that's absolutely terrible and, and and i laugh every time i see it i think oh what kind of laugh is this you know yeah isn't that a wonderful uh mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. yeah now this one it's probably not sunroom it's probably haiku isn't it oh yeah well, unless, unless, you know, so what, what's mm -hmm. going on? Perfect summer day, one blue crayon missing from the box. Oh. I, the reason I put this under sun was I actually had a, a student say one time, well, it could be winter and the per person is trying to draw the perfect summer day. Oh, that's, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> in which case, if you see it that way, well, then maybe more Senru. So, you know, Haiku and Senru, there's there's really a gray, gray area between them. And I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't think too many of the mainline journals, you know, or uh, people worry about it as much as they used to. Yeah. In, in tipping our hat to the controversy, the Virgilio contest finally renamed itself the Haiku and Senru competition because yeah. Every year yeah. we tripped over somebody challenging us for calling it a haiku competition and yeah. having thin room among the winners. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how Red Moon Anthology got around that. They just put them together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, my experience uh, with, with, with students over the last, you know, maybe 20 years or so is that uh, students tend to gravitate or write proportionally more senru than haiku if you were going to make a strict definition, mm -hmm. you know. But, yes, uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We write more about our own experience. From yeah. the contest, I can certainly say that's true. We had the privilege of prejudging the 6,000 or so entries down to the number the IQ Society of America judges will accept. And mm -hmm. the themes are usually around young love and loss and uh, some relationship to nature, but a tremendous amount about our human relationships. Our human yeah. relationships, and yeah. you know that may be a product of the you know the the, the age of the, the students entering. It may be it may be a, a signal that uh, you know young people are spending less and less time out out in nature. I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they too. share. Mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So uh, yeah, what do you think, Elizabeth and Lily? Do you think it? Do you think it's more that kids are spending less time in nature, or because they're, by virtue of your age, you're more just drawn to to relationships? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like it's kind of like a mix of both because I do. I feel like we don't go out in nature as much as like past generations have. Yeah. Like we're kind of more inside using like um, devices, technology. Um, but I do feel like it's a mix of both. And then also the yeah, relations. Yeah, you, would you agree, Lily? I would, I think it's a mix of both too. Yeah, I, I would tend to, I tend to think mm -hmm. so too. Oh, wait, let's go back to, uh, how about this one? Mm. Mm. Very good. Isn't that good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah. So how are we doing? I mean, we're, we're, we're two hours in. I mean, I, you know, we, I'm, I'm good to go for a little longer if you want to. No, I'm fine. Okay. So, no, you, know, you, know, you know, when, when you feel like you're, you're done, just, uh, you know, you can say, you know, check out. Irish goodbye. Yeah. An Irish, <laughs> goodbye. What's an Irish yeah. goodbye. It doesn't have to do with falling down, does it? <laughs> hey, that's an unfair stereotype. That's oh, right. Very true. Listen, I, I can't help it right now. Uh, Sean, it is an unfair stereotype, but my I got, I got roots I got roots back there too. So uh, Sean, have, a, you, have you read Kevin Barry's new um, uh, short story collection, Old Time Music? I haven't. I'm familiar with Kevin Barry, but I have not read it. If you if you you think the Irish suffer, read Kevin Barry's Old Time Music. It's really a good collection of short stories. Okay, that's I, a, that's. A I will definitely. It's fabulous. Okay, haiku are grounded in your senses. Try to describe what you see, touch, taste, and smell. Be alert to what you uh, senses are picking up. River fog, the creak of anchor lines from rusted tugs. Nice. Okay. Um, okay. Let's not. We won't get into this right now. This is uh, some work on translation. Henry, you got one there. You're you're actually featured as one of my translators. Um, huh. You know, if we if we did something about historical perspective, which we won't do today because it's a, it's another whole new tangent, we would start with Basho and talk about. Uh, here's, here's a great. Uh, here, let me, let me see. Did you see this or? Mm -hmm. All right, let me see if I can bring me up. There it is. So there's a nice little book. You can get different translations of this. It's called Narrow Road to the Interior mm -hmm. or some, uh, it's called Narrow Road to the Deep North. And it's, it's uh, Basho uh, back in uh, the, you know, the 16, in 1694, he published this little book. Uh, it, was his, it was his wanderings through uh, the, you know, north of Japan when he left Edo and simply decided to go on a, maybe, a, you know, a, a five-year walk. And uh, it really is sort of the inception of haiku, you know, with Basho mm -hmm. and coming back and discovering that there was a way to record, you know, his keenly perceived moments on this journey. Mm -hmm. uh, we would talk about the four pillars mm -hmm. of Japanese haiku, Basho, Bus Busan, Isa, and Shiki. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. another whole workshop. Um, here's, here's a good, uh, a, a, a really a good tip for all haiku poets. I know we're trying to save on syllables, but, but don't. Uh, eliminate articles. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's certain parts of speech that are your friends. I would say articles are one of your best friends. Um, be, 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 very, be very suspicious of adjectives and adverbs. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely fall in love with, uh, with prepositions. Okay. Uh, and articles, you know, with our, so uh, haiku is supposed to uh, feel conversational. And in English, we, we need the articles. And you'll see sometimes and play around with mixing and matching uh, the, definite, uh, the difference between a definite and indefinite article in a poem can sometimes make all the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so hang on to articles. Um, this is an activity we won't do now, but this is from uh, Jim Emmerich's workshop. And uh, the point was, I think, uh, it, when you go out, don't, don't try, don't worry about, um, you know, um, paring down your haiku to its bare essentials from the beginning. The, the first time, maybe write as much in as you can. Uh, what mm -hmm. I like to think of is uh, the, 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 what is it called, topiary? What's it? Isn't yeah. that the trimming of shrubs? Yeah. You know, the topiarist, you know, there's a big overgrown shrub, kind of does some trimming and then steps back and looks and then goes in and shapes it again. And so uh, get as much down as you can early with observations, then you can go back and kind of shape them and trim them. Um, 
There's a great movie about topiary. topiary. Anybody have ever seen uh, Edward Scissorhands with Johnny Depp? Mm, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a good movie. So the activity here would be, oh, if I don't lose it, would be here. Here is sort of a, uh, you know, the big picture, a frozen wind blown prairie, the heavy loping and breathing of a shaggy uh, brown pony. Mm -hmm. It was the whole observation. But if I were to say to you, in fact, if you want to, let's take two minutes and try it. Can you get this thing down to, a, to 10 or fewer words, 17 or fewer syllables? And the way to do it, and you've got to leave everything in the order in which it appears. Don't, don't begin moving words around. But what would you omit? And, and my guess is no two people are going to do it the same, or maybe a couple will. You know? So you want to give it a quick try? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see if you can get this down to 10 or fewer words, 17 or fewer syllables, and you can't, don't change any word order or line order. Seven words. Yeah. You got seven words? Seven. <clears throat> Who's got Henry, is that you? Yeah. Windblown prairie, loping, breathing, shaggy pony. Okay, where did I go here? Oop. There it is. What? You get that? Yeah. Okay, you got windblown prairie, loping, breathing, shaggy, shaggy pony. pony. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. I did a very different take. Wind yeah. Blown me. yeah, let's hear it. Windblown prairie, the heavy breathing of a shaggy pony. That's exactly what I wrote, Robin. Okay. Exactly find, what I wrote. Find, listen, find your kindred spirit right now. Yeah, Robin. Robin Anna. Okay, you, you, two are, you two are linked. <laughs> okay, anybody else have a different uh, rendering of that? Yeah, I, I, Jennifer, go ahead. Okay, frozen prairie, the mm. heavy loping of a shaggy pony. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I had. Who's who's next? I had the same. You did, okay. Karen. You do. I, no, I had the same as, as um, the lady you just said spoke now. Yeah. I don't yeah. think wind blown is necessary in prairie because aren't prairies open places? It would, it would be wind blown anyway. Yeah, maybe. Right, right. Yeah, so, descri that description, you can let people imagine it. Yeah. So I think, I think the, you know, I mean, so there's no right or wrong way. Um, but what, what it would say to me is that if I, if I, you know, um, there's a line in David Lanoon's book again, you know, nothing is in the picture that's not of the picture. Get the picture. Yeah. Almost sounds like a Zen Cohen, but you know, get, get it all down and then go back and decide, you know, what you can leave out. What is it you really need to say? Because you've got to say it with brevity and, and be very succinct. Someone once described it to me as pick up that empty paper towel roll and you're looking through it and keep only what fits. Well, I'm, and in fact, uh, Robin, I'm going to show you an activity, something, uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to a couple of the kids' poems, and I'm going to show you something that is exactly that, you know, called narrowing the focus, mm -hmm. and there's a way we can, we can do that. Um, okay, so we won't, you know, uh, yeah, what the, the activity here is to what are the essential details in the poem, early spring before she can tie it, the balloon escapes. So, you know, by essential details, I mean, what, what is the moment, you know, the moment that our attention is drawn to something uh, and, and then we kind of fill in the rest of the picture. So I would say, you know, my answer to this one would be, well, it's the moment, the, the balloon, you yeah. know, yeah, right. So, so is, it, is the balloon on a string? Is she, is she you know, is she blowing it up? Uh, I, you know, well, I guess she's blowing it up, isn't she? Okay. How about this one? I, I thought like she was a child because she's not old enough to tie it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Spring rain, each empty swing hangs over its puddle. <laughs> yeah. 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 What's your attention drawn there to, you know? Yeah. Is it the swing? Is it the puddle? Is it sort of the, the emptiness? 
how the how the holes how the puddles were formed in the first place for the kids' mm -hmm. feet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The implied detail is the most important one. Yeah, the implied. Mm -hmm. part, right. Mm -hmm. In so short a form as haiku, uh, you must get right to the point and show the part, the thing that captured your attention, the one among the many, the close up, the general scene, the last, the first, the opposite. Oh, yeah. I've seen that mm. one. I'll turn the other way. Mm. Practically all haiku are written in present tense to help the reader feel as if the haiku moment were happening now. So, so that's another re really useful, uh, um, you, you know, uh, component of haiku. Right? Even if it's in a memory or, you know, happened yesterday or, or it's a memory, uh, right in present tense. Mm. Emily Cornish was one of uh, one of the. She was in one of the first classes I ever uh, taught haiku to. Um, and this was back, yeah, well, probably 25 years ago. Emily's probably in her 40s now, or 40. And uh, so the kids came back from school and, uh, you, you know, the old the tried and true, uh, you know, write about your summer vacation. And they had had haiku the, the year before. And I just said, no, nah, I don't want you to write about your summer vacation. I, I, want, I want you to, you, you know, show me how you know summer is gone. You know, mm. how, how, how can you, yeah, mm. how can you record in haiku the passage of time? Summer cottage, the bullfrog slips my grasp. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. I think Emily, I think this was a Virgilio winner way back in the day. Isn't mm. it? Absolutely. And it's so, it feels so tactile to me, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and, and slips in the, in the bullfrog. And, yes. Yes. I mean, I think it's a beautiful poem. Um, here's some more. Uh, these are some Virgilio uh, haiku winners. Uh, way, from, for me, now this goes back uh, maybe 15, 20 years. Winter night cracks in the floorboard widen. Mm. Yeah. And these were, uh, these were uh, ninth, ninth graders at a place called School of the Arts. I've had the, the, the good fortune of working with some uh, very creative and motivated oh, kids in my, in my years of teaching. <laughs> Saying goodbye. So Cindy Tronk, she was uh, she had emigrated here from I think either Laos, I think, and uh, I asked her to write about that in haiku and uh, said goodbye. The river flowing one way. Wow. Yeah. That one, uh, I get that one still brings tears. I, and probably uh, I don't know if it would if I didn't know the story, but it might. You know, I mean, it's so so succinct. Cold. Definitely loss of some kind, isn't it? What's that? It definitely gives you a feeling of loss of some kind. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that strikes me about haiku is it really is a form that allows us to tap into our humanity. You know, I mean, it's a direct, you know, sometimes an arrow to the heart. This mm. one here has a story too. Hannah Amira, um, her family uh, emigrated here from Palestine. Cold night, the phone call from a disowned sister. Mm. And there's oh. a whole story behind that and uh, coming to America and a sister that was put out of the household. Uh, mm. But it, it's a beautiful poem, isn't it? Mm. So very mm. much, Bad. it's got a sunroof feel, but it could be haiku because of the cold night. So mm -hmm. this is the one, Robin, uh, you're talking about looking through, looking through the, uh, you, you know, the, the paper roll. So, uh, Alexa, this was, uh, there, there was a cemetery. If you ever get to Rochester, New York, uh, the one place you absolutely want to go is called Mount Hope Cemetery. Uh, it's, it's, there's old glacial moraine, drumlins and, and eskers and it's a beautiful cemetery. Interestingly enough, uh, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony are buried a stone's throw from one another. Wow. Yeah. Mm. It's an absolutely, it's, it's, it's the place in Rochester to go. Used to be mm -hmm. East Kodak, but they shut down, right? So, um, so I would walk the kids over. The cemetery is within a mile of the school where I taught, and uh, I we would talk to the kids about narrowing the focus or looking through that, right? Looking through that paper roll, and mm -hmm. but I would say to the kids, you know, pretend, you know, pretend this, you know, put your fingers up, pretend you've got like a, a viewing screen, and what I want mm -hmm. you to do is is begin to look through and and find something and narrow the focus. One of the things that Mount Hope is famous for is in the winter time, uh, historically there've been there've been flocks of uh, American crows uh, in the hundreds of thousands. They mm -hmm. roost during the winter, 
uh, there's a cacophony of, of sound and the crows come in at dusk in the winter time. Mm. You know? yeah. and, 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 uh, and so we went over there, took a walk and the crows were there, it was a winter time walk. And all of a sudden I saw Alexa and, and she was, oh, and there's also a hillside full of gravestones, you know, beautiful on the, on the glacial. And she was, she was doing one of these. And I said, well, what are you, what are you, Alexa, what are you doing? And she said, I, I, I want the one among the many. So she, this was her poem because she found a gravestone with one one crow perched on top. Mm. Yeah, mm. this is just a sweet moment. Mm. <laughs> and there's another one. It's another one. So we would also take walks. Our school was quite near the center of the city, and, and we would we would walk down uh, through through the city and and observe. Mm -hmm. so in the homeless man's cup filled with silver. Mm -hmm. And so there's an interesting twist there, isn't there? What's it? What do you see in the cup? The moon and moonlight. Moonlight. Could be moonlight. Mm -hmm. It could. We would hope it would be mm -hmm. coins, but who knows, right? Beautiful poem. Summer dusk. I don't know. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to go through a couple of these quickly, and then we'll pause. Uh, here's some more. This, now, these are some kids from the school where I teach now, and these were actually these were some Virgilio win winners. A crack in the parking lot. I type tight rope to the car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I and I will say, uh, we're, uh, Elizabeth and uh, um, Lily, are you still here? Mm -hmm. I think they've gone. I don't blame them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what I found is uh, junior high kids are, 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 the, are probably the best, it's the best age to work yeah. with. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason why I think is they, they, have the, they have the gift, they have the power of language. They're sophisticated enough with their language, but they still have a degree of, of uh, you know, they, they've suspended their disbeliefs. Mm -hmm. They haven't developed their disbeliefs yet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and uh, as they get into high school, they become a little more reticent. I think mm -hmm. this was about Grace and her grandfather fishing. Ah, oh, lovely. Yeah, mm -hmm. this one is interesting. This was an easy fix in a workshop. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Ed had it written. His original poem was uh, "The Wind Through the Teeth of the Jack O' Lantern," and that's one of the things you want to be careful of. Sometimes a sentence masquerades as a haiku. Mm -hmm. So if you say "The Wind Through the Teeth of the Jack O' Lantern," it's really it's one part. Mm -hmm. And the kids picked up, they said, oh, well, Addison, it's an easy fix. Just move, you know, just so play with line order, mm -hmm. your poems, through the teeth of the jack-o'-lantern, pause the wind. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. so sure it would have worked the other way. Mm -hmm. This was, so we did a whole, whole haiku thing about, uh, the, you know, the elders in our lives, you know, whether they be grandparents or, uh, you, you know. So uh, I will give the kids, you know, specific things to go out and look for, you know, and this, this had to do with observing people's hands, observing people's hands in motion, doing something. And this was uh, Olivia Babuka, Babuka Black, uh, her, her recollection of her, her grandmother at a sewing machine or something, you know. Um, yeah. Isn't this nice? <laughs> Yeah, mm, so, I remember that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then there's tons more. I don't know if we want to look at more of these. Yeah, nice. this one here. The so the the other thing I'll say about parts of speech, and then I will shut up, is uh. So we talked about parts of speech. Uh, verbs, verbs are absolutely your your if you know your best friend. They can they can take prepositions and articles along with them. But if you look at this poem, Winter Dusk, what what verb in there is absolutely nails his poem yeah. it's the word clotting clotting, clotting right yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's the verb you know that that does it okay so mm -hmm. i'm going to hurry through these are you know a bunch of poems written by kids mm. and i i just want to real quick i'll go <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Simpsons did a show on haiku, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. 
So I would encourage you to, we could spend some time, uh, one of the traditions in haiku traditions is to write a haiku about the moon. I mm -hmm. consider you to write a moon haiku. There have been, ask Charlie Trumbull, he'll send me the first 3,000 in a heartbeat. <laughs> you have a moon haiku. So, so the old field throbbing with insects, the summer moon. See the like verb? Throbbing thing? makes that run, yeah. Throbbing with throbbing. insects. Yeah, I mean, that's what <clears> feels <throat> very sensual. You know, now that the kids are gone, I can say that word, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just feels very, very sensual, very, you yeah. know. Moonlit swim, the galaxy moves around me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So you can go, if I went to this book, to Shet Sajiki, I would find all of these, these words and phrases in there. Harvest moon, half moon, rising moon, waning moon, summer moon. There's also a rich tradition in Native American literature uh, where the, mo the different months moons are, are named. And they made, they've made their way into haiku. For example, I think February is hunger moon. Mm -hmm. uh, March is sap moon. So you can actually call on some of that, you know, the Native American uh, First Peoples tradition and use some of that language in your poetry. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can write about uh, holidays. Mm. A rich tradition there. Look at this one. Bill. Oh, this is, a, this is a wild one, yeah. <laughs> well, if you know about radiant heat and how, how icicles form, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it really, really to me just says so <laughs> Yeah. Um, isn't that cute? Yeah. 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 Words, words with friends. Up. What's yeah. that? Words with friends. Yes, yeah, Scrabble is <laughs> transformed. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that clever? Yep. What a nice yeah. poem. You can uh, Halloween party after a few drinks, the masks come off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, there's toilet paper again. A dry leaf. <laughs> oh, no. dry leaf. It's, 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 it's a dry leaf. <laughs> It'll do. But this is you noticed earlier it was a small roll. This is the uh, this is the post-pandemic roll. <laughs> yeah. Limit limited supply uh -huh. in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Veterans Day, a few red leaves linger in the trees. Oh, oh my. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, morning starting the fire with last night's coals. Nice. Um, okay. Story. So, you know, again, a, a sort of a review, look for comparative qualities, storm clouds, right? Water darkens around the tea bag. Mm -hmm. And then contrasting or comparative, some dimes among the pennies, speckled carp. You know, notice how the preposition in that one kind of unifies it, right? Among. Yes, well, yeah, among, yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. among the pennies or among the pennies speckled carp. Mm -hmm. So when I said prepositions are sort of a real, you know, friendly uh, 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 part of speech, they can often unify the two parts of the poem with that prepositional phrase in the middle. It really mm -hmm. works well often. Mm -hmm. And then different qualities, you know, the contrast, chilly night, the warmth of the takeout bag. Winter stillness, the sound of branches breaking. Isn't that beautiful? You can add uh, gerunds, ing words, spring wind, mm -hmm. teaching a child to whistle. Oh, cute. Yeah. isn't that cute? And then yeah, that's narrow, cute. narrowing the focus. So that that's where. So sometimes, if you want to draw this on your paper, draw an inverted pyramid. So draw an inverted mm -hmm. pyramid, and uh, so we'll say that you know the first one uh, set the scene. So that could be someone is somewhere. Narrow the focus. Something happens. And then the last, the point of the pyramid going down is someone learns something. And, you know, we either the, the writer is learning something, the reader's learning something. Mm -hmm. You can be punny. This is one of my favorite all time haiku <laughs> headstone, a dash between the years. Yeah, wow. Uh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Isn't this amazing? Warm night, <laughs> a soda machine <laughs> jacks my coin. <laughs> John Stevenson, who, uh, who is the editor of um, The Heron's Nest, mm -hmm. president of the Haiku Society of America. Um, he, he's, 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 I would put him in the category of probably one of the, the best poets uh, you know, writing haiku in English. Uh, he has a whole bunch where he uses a, a question marks. Mm -hmm. Fireflies, could I still catch one? Oh, there's that still again. Still. Mm -hmm. Still, yeah. 
one. Yeah, yeah there okay. it is. Yeah, Anna, absolutely. Mm. A hard rain. What cloud could have held it? Mm. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can use you can use uh, uh, you know place names. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, old faithful. The crowd arrives right on time. <laughs> <laughs> so place names are fair game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and through Japanese tradition, there are, th- there are three, you know, a kind of um, uh, uh, qualities, loneliness, uh, austerity, and mm-hmm. on my brother's pro- property, autumn wind. I like this one a lot. A bear ball burning in the barn, winter fields. Oh, I can see that. And this one, a lone boxcar stands on a prairie siding, autumn evening. Mm. You know, they all kind of evoke that feeling of melancholy in me anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're, almost, we're almost done with part one. There are a whole bunch of, uh, um, remember we started with three lines, but there are poets who are experimenting. Uh, Gendai, I think I'm pronouncing that right, or Nam, normative haiku, are, are attempts to write in one line. Mm-hmm. The clouds in the lake. If you picture that, that's really quite brilliant, right? My head in the clouds in the lake. Mm-hmm. between mm-hmm. statues, the rest of history. Mm-hmm. Mm. The day now burnt out fireflies. Um, Have so- you seen any of Lori Miner's monoku? There's a young poet who's writing about the ugliest of subjects as a mm-hmm. kind of a personal therapy, writing wow. extraordinary poetry. I have one pulled up here that is summer, the heat of his punch. Oh. Yeah. She writes yeah. mostly monoku, although she writes quite a few different forms. And yeah. I think she's in a breakthrough position going into places haiku hasn't gone before. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Robin, there used to be a, a journal years ago. Um, uh, uh, Dorothy Howard, I think, published it. It was called Raw Nerves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know that one. Yeah, it was out of Canada, mm-hmm. and uh, Raw Nerves was a haiku journal, and, and she welcomed those haiku that dealt with sort of edgy, tab- sometimes taboo issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, the stuff, some of the stuff in there was, was maybe over the top, but some of it was totally disarming. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, really. Yeah, Laurie, Laurie runs an online magazine called Femku. Yes, Femku is amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I think yeah. It, it all just shows the versatility of the form mm-hmm. and that it isn't dead and canonized it's growing all the time and expanding i know that our house named for nick virgilio nick was writing about things that were not considered available haiku topics like Mm -hmm. like uh hookers knitting booties Mm -hmm. on the bus yeah Um, it was going into forbidden spaces then too Mm -hmm. uh if we if we uh, there's another person who uh Toward the end of his uh, writing career, Richard Wright, who touched on mm-hmm. some really yeah. sort of sort of mm-hmm. taboo subjects. Yeah. Um, should, should I, Sean? Can, should I keep going, or do you want me to shut up? I think uh, I think do you want to do a part two, like uh, in a week, yeah, next weekend, or a couple weeks from now. Yeah. Right? Let me just let me just blast through this real quickly, and then uh, and then I'll be gone. Okay. So <laughs> so um, I just want to get to okay. So there's you know vertical coup. This one is a famous poem. Some people argue until they turn blue. Uh, tundra, it's, 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 it's one word on, on, on the page. In, uh, in the wood pile, the broken ax handle. Two lines. Between Goethe and Grace. That's great. Yeah. Fossil. This is Nick Cerulio. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, he also wrote a one word that was Californication long before the TV show picked it up and stole it. Californication. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sean, what we could do, um, I have, I actually, I, I have Nick's, some of my favorite Nick Virgilio haiku at the end of this, um, but we may not get to him today. But if we, if we were to do something else, if anybody wanted to read, you know, I would say we'd keep it with anybody in this group who wanted to come back. And what, what we, what we might want to do mm-hmm. is, is do a workshop yes. and everybody brings their mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Let's, so mm-hmm. let's plan this so no, that. Yeah, yes. can, we can talk about that. But so there's this whole art of revision, things that you would want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can look at Billy Collins. There's Nick yeah. Virgilio. Uh, we could look at some of Nick's mm-hmm. stuff. We could look at a little bit of Richard Wright. Who yeah. out the yeah. After he left the country and moved to France. Look at Jack Kerouac. 
who was one of the first people mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, break the 575 rule. And, what uh, I particularly like, Tom, about doing a follow-up that is actually workshopping some poems by the people in this group is that when you taught that train the trainer workshop for teachers for us years ago, teachers who were there learned how to workshop with their kids. And I think yeah. if we are mm -hmm. comfortable filming that one as well, and I think we're all pretty egoless in this process, that it is a very mm -hmm. important part of instructing. It's first you tell people what the goal looks like, and then you have to show mm -hmm. people how to get towards the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Robin, I'll just jump in there and say, you know, uh, the, by, by teaching, you know, try to express your understanding of someone else. That's the best way to learn, really. Mm, absolutely. You, you know? So I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Anybody who's interested in, in doing a, a workshop to workshop their own haiku, mm -hmm. and I'll link up with Tom and we'll figure out a perfect date. Uh, I guess ideally another Saturday at 1 p.m. Sure. Eastern time. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe in a week or two weeks, three weeks, uh, if, if you're interested, Tom, if you would have us, uh, I would love. I would love to. And so what I would suggest everyone is uh, to, so that we can, so if we're in the classroom, we'd use like the whiteboard or something. We'd actually, mm -hmm. so if you're, if you're in and you want between now and when, whenever Sean and I figure out this is going to go, you should probably, Sean, you can give everyone my email um, so that I can, we can screen share and do the same kind of workshopping I would do with the mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. Send me your poems and, and uh, you know, uh, just let me know if you want, if you want them up there anonymously, which is probably just as well, you, you know, mm -hmm. you know you, and we, we could do some workshopping. We'll start, we'll pick up with the, uh, with the revision exercises and I'll just walk you through those. We'll look at some poems by some of those, you know, uh, those people who were prominent in shaping what we uh, understand to be haiku now, Richard Wright, Kerouac. Uh, I want to look at Nick Virgilio's work because I think it, I think it is, I think it's essential to understanding where haiku is going or where it started, and uh, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we'll also invite the people who participated but had to drop off earlier, and then we'll have a nice sample. Yeah, definitely. Over. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I'll type up the email. Come. What's that? I was just saying thank you for volunteering well, to continue with us. We're, we're thrilled. Oh, yeah, very thank fantastic. Thank you for being great invited. Great to see you, Tom. Okay, everyone. Have a great day, and I'll be talking thank to you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. I'll be in touch with everyone. Hey, thanks for hosting, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thanks, Tom. Right, this was great. It must have been great. Thanks ever so much, guys. A real pleasure. Thanks, really fun. John, can you stick around for a minute or? Sure. Yeah, I'll stick around. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, when you when you hear from back, if anybody wants to get on board, you know, what we'll, we'll ask them to do is send in a, maybe a selection of three to five of the poems they'd most like to workshop. And that way, you know, we could probably get through it in a couple hours. And, uh, you know. I, I know I wrote three haiku during your workshop, just being inspired. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, uh, yeah, that's good. You know, I have so many haiku materials here. I mean, I'd be glad to send people stuff. Um, if you want to put out there, I've got, I've got an attic full of, you know, uh, journals and old Red Moon anthologies. I don't mind posting that to people. If you want to put in there, if they want to include a mailing address and they're interested in like a haiku care package, right? Right. Uh, I would be I, glad to. That's to, very yeah. generous of you. I will take whatever resources that you uh, you would like to spare for sure. Yeah. Well, I think it's yeah. You know, most of the stuff was given to me, so I you know it's uh, it's still in boxes. So let people know if they want they want something sent to them. You know, I could throw a few journals in and uh, get me the list sooner than later, and then we could actually there's a really good workshop activity we could do with those journals. Awesome. Yeah. I'll, I'll write a follow-up email. Even if people haven't emailed me, uh, see, I already got it. I'm already starting to get emails from people, uh, wanting to do this workshop. So, yeah. Um, yeah, good. people are really excited. I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Terrific. Well, good. Thanks a ton for having me today. Thank you so thank much. You. Can't thank you enough. Thank you. Fantastic. Right, see you. Bye Henry. Good seeing you. Thank you. Nice to meet all of you. Nice to meet well. you. Bye. 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 All right, I'll, uh, I'll end this now. Farewell.